Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tkinter module in Python. This is basically the first tutorial where we are going to start on with Tkinter and in this tutorial we are going to cover the introduction to Tkinter that is basically a GUI framework for Python. Now most of you must have written a code and you might have run it in a command line terminal or an integrated development environment which you usually call the IDE and the code basically produce an output and the output is basically based on what you expect out of it either on the terminal or on the IDE itself. However, what if you want your system to have a fancy looking user interface or maybe your application requires you to have a graphical user interface or a GUI. Now GUI is nothing but a desktop application that provides you with an interface that helps you basically to interact with the computer and it enriches your experience of giving a command to your code. Now they are used to perform different tasks in desktops, laptops and other electronic devices. Now some of the application where you might have seen the power of GUI might be when you will be creating a calculator which would have a user interface and functionalities that persist in a calculator or you might be creating a text editor, a IDE for quoting or all on a GUI application. Moreover you might have created or used games like Sudoku, Chess, Solitaire Online and all of these are games that you can play using the GUI interaction. Then you might also have served browsers like Chrome, Firefox, Microsoft Edge and any other like that and that all are also some kind of GUI application. Now there is one more interesting use case that would be a GUI for controlling a drone from your laptop and the GUI would probably have two buttons to maneuver the drone along with a screen that would show the camera feed captured by the drone in real time. So I hope that you have understood the idea of why do we need a graphical user interface along with a code because that is what actually helps a user to interact with your system and also to understand what your system is capable of doing. So let us see some of the frameworks that Python provides to develop a GUI. The first one is the PyQt module. Now PyQt is one of the favored cross-platform Python bindings implementing the Qt library for the Qt application development framework. Now Nokia primarily owns Qt. Currently PyQt is available for almost all operating systems like Unix, Linux, Windows, Mac operating system X. Now it blends the best of Python and Qt and it provides flexibility to the programmer to decide whether to create a program by writing a pure Python code or use Qt designer to create visual dialogues. Then we have got the second one that is known as Kiwi and Kiwi is for the creation of new user interfaces and it is an open GLES2 accelerated framework. Now much like PyQt, Kiwi also support almost all platforms like Windows, Mac operating system, Linux, Android and iOS. It is an open source framework and it comes over with almost 20 preloaded widgets in its toolkit. Then the next one we have in the GUI platforms is the Jython. Now Jython is basically a Python port for Java which gives Python scripts seamless access to Java class libraries on the local machines. So Jython is basically something like Python with Java. Then the next one is the WX Python, initially known as WX Windows, now as a WX widgets library, is also an open source abstract level wrapper for cross-platform GUI library. It is implemented as a Python expansion module. Now with WX Python, you as a developer can create name application for Windows, Mac operating system and Unix. Then we have got PyGUI, which is a graphical application cross-platform framework for Unix, Macintosh and Windows. Compared to some other GUI frameworks, PyGUI is by far the simplest and the lightweight of them all as the API is purely in sync with Python. PyGUI inserts very less code between the GUI platform and Python application hence the display of the application usually display the natural GUI of the platform. And then finally we have got the 
framework that is the discussion for today's tutorial as well as this complete section that is tkinter. Now tkinter commonly comes bundled with python using the tk and is python's standard GUI framework. It is famous for its simplicity and graphical user interface. It is again open source and it is available under the python license. Now usually tkinter comes pre-installed with python 3 and you don't need to bother about the installing part. But still, if you are having any problem, you can just go on and use the pip commands or you can just go on and directly install it from your IDE or you can just go on into the settings of your compiler, the interpreter settings and you can go on and install it from there. I'll show you also how you can just go on and do it. But I assure you that if you are using Python 3, then Tkinter comes pre-installed with that. So I hope that you have understood the frameworks that are available. So now right in front of you, you can see a very simple GUI with the help of Tkinter and this is going to help you understand what is the flow of a Tkinter app. So let's break down this uh, diagram which you can see right in front of you and understand what, what each component is basically handled. So first of all, the first thing you are going to notice over here, that is the key component also, is basically importing the Tkinter module. For sure, when you want to use a module, you have to import it. In the next step, you initialize the window manager. Now, you initialize the window manager with tkinter.tk method and you assign it to a variable. And we are going to see how this is going to be done when we move on to our compiler. Basically, the tkinter.tk, which I am telling you that is used to initialize the window manager, is basically a method that creates a blank window with a close button, a maximize button and a minimize button on the top as a usual GUI should have. Then as an optional step, you will rename the title of the window as you like, which you can see right here. It's, it says rename the GUI window and at the top of it, you can see that it has been actually boxed up in a dotted line and you can see that at the top it says optional, which means renaming the GUI window is actually optional. You don't have to do it. If you want to do it, you can just go on and do it with window.title that is also built in and in the brackets, you can just specify the title of the window which you want to make. The next one is define the label widgets. So you make use of a widget called basically label, which is used to insert some text into a window. After that, you make use of the Tkinter geometry management attribute that is usually packed to display the widget in size it requires. And the final step, as you can see, says main loop method. As the last step, you should use this main loop method to display the window until you manually close it. it it basically runs an infinite loop in the backend. And then we have got the concept of event driven programming. Now anything that happens in a user interface is basically an event. Simple as that. We say that when an event is fired, whenever the user does something, for example, he can just go on and click on a button. He can just go on and click on any key on his keyboard. He can just click on a label or he can just have, let's say a drop down box. He can have a combo box. If you click on anything, something must happen. And that is what is actually called as even driven, even driven programming. Now some even could, could also be triggered by occurrences which are not controlled by the user. For example, a background task might uh, complete or a network connection might be established or lost. So our application needs to be monitored or listen for all the events that we find interesting and respond to them in some way if they occur. To do this, we actually associate certain functions with particular events. We call a function which performs an action in response to an event or an event handler. In simple words, we bind handlers to events. If I give you a very simple example of this, let's say you have a button in your GUI window. If you click on that button, something must happen. And what is that must? That is actually encapsulated in a function. So whenever you click on a button, let's say some function is going to get called and whatever is present in that function is going to get executed. And that is what is exactly we are going to do in this section. So Tkinter basically provide us with a variety of common GUI elements which we can use to build our interface such as buttons, menus, 
and various kind of entry fields and display areas. We call all of these elements as widgets. We are going to construct a tree of widgets for our GUI. Each widget will have a parent widget all the way up to the root window of our application. For example, a button or a text field needs to be inside some kind of containing window. Now the widget classes provide us with a lot of default functionalities as well. They have methods for configuring the GUI appearances, for example, arranging the elements according to some kind of layout and for handling various kind of user driven events. Once we have constructed the backbone of our GUI, we will need to customize it by integrating it with our internal application class. And this is exactly what we are going to be doing right in this section. So I hope that you have understood what is event driven programming, what are the GUI platforms which you can go on and use and you've also seen the introduction to TechEnter as well. Now from the next tutorial we are going to compare the very famous uh, GUI platform with TechEnter. We are going to have a comparison between the PyQt and TechEnter and we are also going to have a comparison between Tkinter and WX Python. So then you are going to see that why Python has to launch so many GUI platforms because you might be thinking that Python should have launched only one platform and everyone should have gone with that and used that. Why Python has to waste so much money and create so much platforms? Why Python has to make it so complicated? In the next tutorial and right after that tutorial, we are going to see the comparison of two GUI platforms with the Tkinter module that is the WX Python and the PyQt and then you are going to understand why Python has to create a lot of GUI platforms and which one should you be using whenever some condition occurs. So I hope that you have understood what we have discussed in this tutorial. So for this tutorial that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tkinter module in Python. In the previous tutorial you have seen the comparison between Tkinter and the WX Python module. Now in this tutorial we are going to have one more comparison and this time we are going to uh, compare the PyQt module with the Tkinter module. Now both these modules the Tkinter module and the PyQt modules are very useful for designing acceptable GUIs but at the same time that differ in terms of adaptability and functionality. Mostly, Tkinter is all about writing GUI yourself. Program your settings or functionalities in the same script. On the other hand, in PyQt, you separate the GUI in a script and you use your Python knowledge from another script. Instead of creating your own code for the user interface, you can simply adopt the Qt designer functions to develop your application. So let's see what are the main differences and what are the main advantages of PyQt over Tkinter and Tkinter over PyQt respectively. So let's start with the first one that is PyQt and in the first tutorial where we were covering the introduction to Tkinter, we have also covered a very basic introduction to what is PyQt. So let's just move on to the advantages of using PyQt. Now the first advantage we have as you can see right in front of you is coding flexibility. Now GUI programming with Qt is designed around the concept of signals and slots for establishing communication among objects. That permits flexibility when dealing with GUI events and results in a smoother code base. The next advantage is that PyQt is more than a framework. Basically Qt uses a wide array of native platform APIs for the purpose of networking, database creation and many other things. It offers the primary access to them via a unique API. Then we have got various UI components in PyQt where the Qt offers several widgets such as buttons or menus that are all designed with a basic appearance across all supported platforms. Then we have got various learning resources because PyQt is one of the most used UI framework for Python. You can get easy access to a wide array of documentation. And finally, it is very easy to master because PyQt comes with a user-friendly, state-forwarded API functionality along with specific classes linked to Qt C++. This allows the user to use previous knowledge from either Qt or C++, making PyQt very, very easy to master. 
but as everything has advantages and it has disadvantages as well so PyQt also come with a bit of disadvantages which are listed right in front of you the first one is that it lack the python specific documentation for classes in PyQt5 that is the latest version of PyQt secondly it requires a lot of time for understanding all the details of PyQt meaning it is a quite steep learning curve then if you move on to the main topic that is stickinter and you talk about the advantages of it the first one is of the commercial use it is available out of charge for commercial usage then we have got that it is featured in the underlying python library the third one is the creation of executables now creating executables for tkinter application is more accessible since tkinter is included in python and as a consequence it comes with no other dependencies and the last one is that it is simple to understand and master as tkinter is a limited library with a simple api being the primary choice for creating fast guis for python scripts then it also has certain disadvantages over PyQt. The first one is that Tkinter does not include advanced widgets. It has no similar tool as Qt Designer for Tkinter. And finally, it does not have a nav look and feel. Now the question here is that what to choose? Anyhow, in most situations, the best solution is using PyQt considering the advantages and disadvantages of both the PyQt and Tkinter. GUI programming with Qt is created around signals and slots, as I told you, for communication among objects. Thus, it provides flexibility while it gets to the programming, programmer access to a wide array of tools. Whereas, if you talk about Tkinter, it can indeed be useful for those that want to design a fundamental and rapid GUI for Python script yet for a more advanced programming result almost all programmers opt for the functionalities that comes with PyQt. They admit it is worth mastering the advanced knowledge of PyQt due to the professional programming results that come along. Thus when it comes to PyQt versus Tkinter it all depends on how much you want to learn and how much you want to discover. To conclude this comparison section I would say that actually it is TK that is far more advanced than PyQt or WX in some manner and it is a bit less advanced than PyQt or WX in some manners. And if you say that why it is advanced than PyQt or WX in some manners, the first one is that TK is still ahead of most of all GUI toolkit by as much as 15 to 20 years as it is one of the three of the only GUI widget toolkits made from the original toolkit library and is and it is basically one of the only three GUI toolkits beside the GTK and the NCSA mosaic canvas toolkit that powers both the proprietary underlying HTML rendering engines that are used by Netscape navigators, WebKit, WebView, IE, Edge, Safari, Chrome, Chromium among a few others. The main reason it is so advanced is its ability to preset JavaScript triggers for after render events with its tags, marks, and configuration and its binding methods. One of these binding methods is the ability to set hyperlinks while suspending their path data for processing web requests from user clicks in both regular and open click events. Many also are not aware that before 2009 there was still over 50 web browsers with rendering engines entirely developed using TK that at that time were still being downloaded. Now Python does lack the 3D OpenGL that comes with TK 8.6 and lack the video codecs that are used in the TK version but they can be Pi objects directly tied in and used but only a handful of us are doing so. Also to mimic all other GUI libraries all one has to do is that he has to place all the widgets and he has to create your own or place them individually inside frames for each one. The frames are the secret behind Tkinter and if placed within a canvas give you full things such as radius buttons, cells for rendering HTML blocks and new widgets. So there are reasons why you have to choose Tkinter but if you have got some reasons that you have to choose PyQt or WX Python 
you are more than welcome but you must learn about all of these modules so i recommend that you must have a knowledge of tkinter you must have a knowledge of pyqt in which you must have the knowledge of the list, latest version that is pyqt5 and you must also have the knowledge of wx python because all of these three are the main gui coding libraries in fashion nowadays so i hope that you have understood the comparison between these modules and i hope that you must now have the reason why you have to choose one of them so i guess that is it with these two tutorials or you may say the comparison part thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the tkinter module in python and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about the widgets we have in tkinter so basically tkinter provides various controls such as buttons labels text boxes and many other things that can be used in a gui application now these control are basically known as widgets or in this you can say tkinter widgets now there are different type of widgets in tkinter so let's just have a look and have a quick overview of all of these widgets so let's uh, just start on with the first one we have that is the simplest of all that is a button now the button widget is used to display buttons in your application very simple then you have got canvas now the canvas widget is basically used to draw shapes such as lines ovals polygons and rectangles in your application then you have got check button and the check button widget is used to display a number of options as check boxes and the user can select multiple options at a time then we have got frame and the frame widget is used as a container widget to organize other widgets then we have got label the label widget is used to provide a single line caption for other widgets and it can also contain images then we have got list box the list box widget is used to provide a list of options to a user then we have got menu button then the menu button widget is basically used to display menus in your application then you have got simple menu and the menu widget is used to provide various commands to a user and these commands are contained inside the menu button then we have got message the message widget is used to display multi-line text fields for accepting values from a user then we have got radio button the radio button widget is used to display a number of options as radio buttons and the user can select only one option at a time then we have got scale the scale widget is used to provide a slider widget then we have got scroll bar and the scroll bar widget is used to add scrolling capabilities to various widgets such as list boxes some other widgets that include are text and the text widget is used to display text in multiple lines then we have got top level that is used to provide a separate window container then we have got a spin box widget that is a variant of the standard tkinter entry widget which can be used to select from a fixed number of values then we have got paint window that is a container widget that may contain any number of panes that can be arranged horizontally or, or vertically then we have got label frame that is a simple container widget its primary purpose is to act as a spacer or container for complex window layouts then we have got tk message box and this module is used to display message boxes in your application so these are the tkinter widgets which you may be coming across when you are creating a gui application using tkinter and you might be needing those when you want to create your GUI application. So I hope that you have understood all of these. We will be discussing each of these in very detail. We are going to see how they are going to be coded, how they are going to be used, how data is going to be fed inside them, how you can just select multiple option, separate option, multi-line text, and a lot of other things. So all of these widgets will be discussed in the next tutorials. So I hope you stick on to those and learn all about these widgets. So for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the tkinter module in python 
Now in the previous tutorial you have covered about the tickenter widgets and in this tutorial we are going to talk about the tickenter standard attributes. So let us have a look at some of their common attributes such as sizes, colors and fonts that can be specified for the widgets we have covered in the previous tutorial. So some of the attributes that are a part of it are dimensions, colors, fonts, we've got anchors, we have got relief styles, we have got bitmaps and finally we have got cursors. So let's start on with the very first one that is about the dimension. So various length, widths and other dimension of widgets can be described in many different units. If you set a dimension to an integer it is assumed to be in pixel. You can specify unit by setting a dimension to a string containing a number followed by. The characters and descriptions are written right in front of you. The first one is C that is for centimeter, then we have got I that is for inches, then we have got M that is for millimeter and then we have got P that is for printers point. If you talk about the length options then we have got certain length options as well. The Kinter expresses a length as an integer number of pixel. The first one is border width that specify the width of the border which gives a three dimensional look to the widget. Then we have got the highlight thickness that is the width of the highlight rectangle when the widget has focus. Then we have got pad x and pad y that are the extra spaces the widget requires from its layout manager beyond the minimum the widget needs to display its content in the x and y direction. Then we have got select border width that is the width of the three dimensional border around the selected items of the widgets. Then we have got wrap length that is the maximum line length for widget that perform word wrapping. The next one is height that is the desired height of the widget that must be greater than or equal to one. Then we have got underline that is the index of the character to underline in the widgets text. Zero is the first character, one is the second and so on. Then the next one we have got is width and as like height it is actually the desired width of the widget. So that was for the first one that is dimension. In the next tutorial we are going to see some of more attributes that are the standard attribute for the widgets. So I guess you have understood dimensions. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tkinter module in Python. In the previous tutorial we were discussing about the Tkinter standard attributes and we covered the first attribute that was dimension. So in this tutorial we are going to continue on with the Tkinter standard attributes and we are going to look into the others we have left. So the first one we use was dimension and the second one we have is colors. Now to kind of represent color with strings. Now there are two general ways to specify colors in Tkinter. The first one is that you can use a string specifying the proportion of red, green and blue in hexadecimal digits. And the second method is that you can use any locally defined standard color name. For example, you can just go on with white, black, red, green, blue or any color that is available and you want that color to be used. So basically there are certain color options with which you are specified and you are restricted to. The first one is the active background. Active background basically represents the background color for the widget when the widget is actually active. Then we have got the active foreground that is the foreground color for the widget when the widget is active. Then we have got the background and background color for the widget is specified using this and this can also be represented as a small form that is BG. Then we have got disabled foreground that is the foreground color for the widget when the widget is disabled. Then we have got foreground that is the foreground color for the widget and the short form for that is FG and it can also be represented using its short form. Then we have got highlight background that is to have the background color of the highlight region when the widget has focus. Then we have got highlight color that is the foreground color of the highlight region when the widget has focus. Then we have got select background that is the background color for the selected items of the widget and then we have got select foreground that is the foreground color for the selected items of the widget. So this was about the attribute colors. Let's move on to the next one that attribute that we are going to discuss now is fonts. 
Now there are basically three types of fonts we have. The first one as you can see is the simple tuple form. Now as a tuple whose first element is the font family that is followed by a size in points optionally followed by a string containing one or more of the style modifiers bold italic underline and over stripe. For example if you have a look at these two the first one is basically hell Vertica 16 for a 16 point Helvetica regular style. The second one is times 24 bold italic that is for a 24 point times bold italic. The second one we have got is the font object fonts. You can create a font object by importing the TK font module and using its font class constructor. Now this is basically the font class constructor. Now here is a bit, you can see that you have got tk dot font tk font dot font and in the brackets you have got options. The options are listed at the right side. The first one is family that is the font family name as a string. Then we have got size that is the font height as an integer in points to get a font and pixels high use dash n. Then we have got weight that is bold for bold face normal for a regular weight. Then we have got slant that is italic for italic roman for unslanted then we have got underline that if you specify one that is for underline text and zero is for normal and then we have got overstrike in which one is for overstruck text and zero is for normal text then finally we have got the x window fonts if you are running under the x window system you can use any of the x font names. Finally we have got anchors and anchors basically are used to define where text is positioned relative to a reference point. So right here at the right side you can see the list of possible anchors attributes which you can use. The first one is NW that stands for North. Then we have got N that stands for North. Then we have got North East, West, we have got Center, we have got East, we have got Southwest, we have got south and we have got southeast for example if you use center as a text anchor the text will be centered horizontally and vertically around the reference point anchor nw will position the text so that the reference point coincides with the northwest that makes it the top left corner of the box containing the text then the anchor w will center the text vertically around the reference point with the left edge of the text box passing through that point and so on. If you create a small widget inside a large frame and use the anchor SE option, the widget will be placed in the bottom right corner of the frame. If you use the anchor N instead, the widget would be centered along the top edge. So whatever I am talking about which one will be centered where, that can be depicted right here in this diagram. You can see that the northwest is at the top left corner then you have got northeast at the top right corner you have got southeast at the bottom right corner you have got southwest at the bottom left corner north south east west are as in their respective order and you have got center at the very center so these are basically the anchors you can have in that so these are the three standard attributes which we have covered in this tutorial we have first covered about colors, then we have talked about fonts, and finally we have talked about anchors. So I guess three more are remaining. We are going to discuss that in the future tutorials as well. So I hope that you have understood these three. We have already covered dimension, so that makes it four of the standard attributes which we have covered till now. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching, and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tikinter module in Python. In this tutorial we are going to talk about buttons. In Tikinter labels are basically used to display information but buttons they are designed for the user to interact with. Buttons are a great way for the user to provide input to your program especially now in the age of the internet when everything is just a click away. So when a user clicks a button, they expect something to happen. Our job as a programmer is to code that specific behavior. Now the programmer determines what happens when a button is clicked. 
This can be set up with the use of a callback function. The callback function has the behavior to be executed when a button is clicked and it can be passed as a parameter to the button constructor when creating a new button. Of course, you we can also define the look and feel of buttons. So we are going to have a look at the event-driven programming concept later. But for now, you need to understand about the basics of button. So if you talk about the syntax of button, it is listed right in front of you. You have got btn, that is a variable equal to button. That is a built-in function used to create buttons. And the parameters, you have got master and you have got options equal to value. Now the master basically represents the parent window to which the button belongs. Then we have got option, which is a list of most commonly used option for this widget. Now these option can be used as a key value pair separated by commas. Now the options that can be listed right in front of you is a long list. So let's just have a look at it. The first one is the active background. That is the background color when the button is under the cursor. Then we have got active foreground. That is the foreground color when the button is under the cursor. Then we have got BD. That is the border width in pixel. The default value for this is equal to two. Then you have got BG, that is the normal background color. Then you have got command, that is the function or method that has to be called when the button is clicked. That is where the event driven programming concept comes into account. The next one is FG, that is the normal foreground text color. Then we have got some other options of which the first one is font. That is the text font to be used for the button's label. We have got height. That is the height of the button in text lines or pixels. Then we have got highlight color. That is the color of the focus highlight when the widget has focus. Then we have got images. That is to have the image to be displayed on the button instead of text if you want to do it. Then we have got justify. That is to show multiple text lines in which left to, do, to left justify each line center to center them or right to right justify them. Then we have got pad X, that is the additional padding left and right of the text and pad Y is for additional padding above and below the text. Then we have got relief. Relief is uh, to specify the type of the border. Some of the values are sunken, raised, groove and rich. Then you have got already the state in front of you, that is you have to set this option to disable to gray out the button and it makes it unresponsive. Has the value active when the mouse is over it? Default is normal. Then you've got underline, the default is minus one, meaning that no character of the text on the button will be underlined. If non-negative, the corresponding text characters will be underlined. Then we have got width, that is the width of the buttons in letters or pixels. And finally, we have got wrap length, that is, if this value is set to a positive number, the text lines will be wrapped to fit within this length. Then we have got certain methods as well. The first one is flash that causes the button to flash several times between active and normal colors. Leave the button in the state it was in originally. Ignore if the button is disabled. Then we have got invoke that calls the button's callback and return what that function return. It has no effect if the button is disabled or there is no callback. So we are going to have a look at all of these, but first have a look at how we are going to create a button. So right here, what we are going to do is the first thing we are going to do is that we are going to import the Tikinter module. So we are going to write in from Tikinter, import everything. So we have imported the entire Tikinter module. Moreover, we are going to import the Tikinter module from the TTK as well. That is for the styling part. Next, what we are going to do is that we are going to create our main window. So we are going to write in root equal to TK and this TK is what is basically going to create our main window. By main window, I mean the area where everything is going to pop up. You create a button, you create any kind of widget that is going to appear right in that root window which you have created using root equal to TK. And by TK, I means a tickinter window has been created using it. Now using this object named root, what we are going to do is that we are going to create buttons and we are going to add those buttons into this root through which we have created our main tickinter window. So if I just give you a demonstration of how 
you can just write in button equal to ttk dot button and this bu double t o n is basically the function that is going to create your button now in this it is going to have some arguments the first argument here is basically going to be the window in which we want to add this button and then after that we are going to specify the options which we have covered earlier in this very tutorial so right here as i told you that the first thing we are going to do is that we are going to define the main window or the root window where we are going to add this button and as i told you that this is going to be the object through which we have created our main tick intro window and that is where we are going to add everything so that's why we have added this button right here and we have specified this object over here now the second parameters is basically going to be the options which you are going to specify through that you can just change the background color of the button the active background color the foreground the for active foreground color and a lot of other things the most important of all is basically going to be the text that is going to appear on the button so we are going to write in text equal to button number one so this is going to be the text that is going to appear on the button after that you are going to use the button object through which you have created your button and you are going to write in pack for now you don't need to worry about pack we are going to discuss that in the next tutorial i guess for now you only need to understand that pack is basically going to just configure or you can say adjust your button onto the screen after that what you're going to do is that you're going to write in root not button it is going to be root dot main loop and root dot main loop is basically something that is going to run your code by root dot main loop it means that it is going to operate the root window and whatever is on the root window so i will re-explain this code but first i will just run this code and as you can see right here that you have got this very very tiny window right here in which you have got a single button that says button number one and if you click on this button nothing is happening right now because there is no code binded at the back of this button all right so this is basically the code to create a very simple button in tickinter gui you have to spec simply define the button function using this ttk and you have to determine the text so this is how basically your button is going to be created so i hope that you have understood how to create a very simple button in the tickinter gui in the next tutorial we are going to talk more about buttons in tickinter gui so i hope that you have understood it so far and we are going to expand it from the next tutorial so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this course and in this tutorial we are going to talk about geometry management in tickinter gui so basically all tickinter widgets have access to specific geometry management methods which have the purpose of organizing widgets throughout the parent widget area now tickinter exposes basically three kind of major manager classes the first one is the pack method this geometry manager basically organizes widgets in blocks before placing them in the parent window then we have got the grid method that is the geometry manager that organizes widgets in a table like structure in the parent widget and finally we have got the place method which basically organizes the widgets by placing them in a specific position in a parent widget so let's just study the geometry management methods briefly the first one as we were talking is basically the pack method and as I told you that this geometry manager organizes widgets in blocks before placing them in the parent widget. If you talk about the syntax of how it works, it is right in front of you. It is widget.pack and then we have got pack options. So in the pack options, you have got a, a variety of things. The first one here is expand as you can see at the left side. It is set to true when the widget expands to fill any space not otherwise used in widgets parent. Then we have got fill that determines whether widget fills and any extra space allocated to it by the packer or it keep its own minimal dimension. In the here we have got none for default axis if you want to fill it horizontally, y is if you want to fill it vertically or you can just write in both if you want to fill both horizontally and vertically. And finally you have got the side option that determines which side of the parent widget packs against. In that we have got top that is for default and then we have got, got bottom left and right. So in the previous tutorial you have used the pack as well when you were packing the 
button and in place of the widget you have written button over there so that was to pack the button so if you just have an example of how it is going to work for that we are going to just move on to our compiler and right here we have got from tkinter import everything and we have got our root window that is root equal to tk now what we are going to do is that we are going to create a frame and we are going to write in frame equal to frame and this this frame over here is basically a built-in function and we are going to specify the root window so this means that we are adding a frame to a window after that we are going to write in frame dot pack the next thing we are going to do is that we are going to create buttons so we are going to write in button frame equal to frame that is going to also get added to the root window and we are going to write in button frame dot back and we are going to specify the site for that as well that is going to be bottom all right so the next thing we are going to do is that we are going to create four buttons so the first one one is going to be the red button and it is going to equal to button that is going to get added to the frame the text on this button is going to equal red and we are going to specify the foreground for this button as well that is going to be red and what we are going to do next is that we are going to write in red button dot back and we are going to specify the site for that as well that is going to be left now what we are going to do is that we will just copy this from here and we are going to paste it for the four buttons we are going to create and this one is going to be the green button this one is also going to change to green button and then it is going to be the blue button it is also going to be blue over here and then we are going to have our black button and this one is also going to change to black we are also going to change the text from red to green over here for the green button from red to blue for the blue button and we are going to change it to black for the black button next thing what we are going to do over here is that we are going to change the foreground as well so we are going to specify this as green this one is going to be blue and finally this one is going to be black now what we are going to do is that we are going to set this as the same that is the side equal to left this one is also going to be at the left this one is also going to be at the left and let's just change this one to bottom all right so we have actually got four buttons we have packed them and fi the final thing we need to do over here is that we need to call the main loop so this is going to be root dot main loop let's just run this code and you are going to understand what is going on over here all right as you can see that you have got four buttons the red button the green button the blue button and the black button but in here i guess this black button needs to be at the bottom side yes the reason behind this is that we have added it to the very frame which is at the left side so we need to add it to the frame the side of which is bottom that is the button frame which we have created so we are going to add the final button to the button frame and that is going to do our job so let's just rerun this code and now you can see that you have got the black button at the bottom so if you have a look at this code you can see that you have got actually two frames let's just scroll it a bit and let's just move it up as you can see that you have got frame number one and as you can see that you have not specified any kind of side to this button so as i told you that if you don't specify it is going to be at the left by default so that's why it is going to be at the left by default then you have got one more frame that is again added to the root window that is at the side bottom which means that it is going to be somewhere around around here the next thing we have done is that we have created four buttons the red button green button blue button and black button we have added the first three buttons to the root window that was frame so this frame was actually in the root and we have added the buttons into the frame and the side for that is default that is left so all these button as you can see 
also are going to be at the left side since we have specified the side to be left. And for the last button we have specified the side to be bottom. So it is going to be at the bottom and it is also going to be at the bottom frame. Now in the previous case you see that when I don't specify button frame over here and I just added it to the frame it was at the left of all these buttons. So the reason behind this is that this was a single frame and everything was going to be added in the sequence. The side was going to be bottom but it was not seen right over here. But now since we have added it to the button frame the side of which is bottom so that's why this button is also going to appear at the bottom that is this black button right over here. So I hope that you have understood how the pack manager works. So let's just move on to the second one that is the grid method. And as I told you about the grid method that this geometry manager organizes widgets in a table like structure in the parent widget. And the syntax for that is written right in front of you. You have got widget.grid and you have got grid option. But there are again a list of options that appears so if you talk about the grid options the first one is column that that is basically the column to put widget in default zero is basically the leftmost column then you have got option number two as column span that is how many columns a widget occupies and the default value for that is one then you have got the ipad x ipad y that is how many pixels to pad the widget horizontally and vertically inside the widgets border then you have got the pad x pad y that is how many pixels to pad the widget horizontally and vertically outside the v's border. Then you have got row that is the row to put widget in the default is the first row that is still empty. Then we have got the row span that is how many row widget occupies the default value for that is again one and finally we have got the sticky. Now what to do if the cell is larger than the widget by default when sticky equal to widget is center in its cell. Sticky may be the string concatenation of zero or more of north, east, southwest, north, east, northwest, southeast and southwest. Compass direction indicating the sides and corner of the cell to which the widgets is going to stick in. So let's just see an example for how this is going to work. So we are going to again move on to our compiler and we are going to just remove this stuff from here. And here what we are going to do is that we are going to create a 4 cross 3 sorry 3 cross 4 grid. So that is going to be for the row and column numbering. So we are going to write in for R that is for row in range 3 since it is going to be a 3 cross 4 grid as I told you. It's going to have a space over here and it is going to be for C that is for column in range that is 4 that is a four, 3 cross 4 grid since. Now here what we are going to do is that we are going to create a variable named as label and we are going to create a label. We are going to add it into the root window and the text that is going to appear is going to be R. After that it is going to grab a value that is going to be from this R that is uh, going to be 0 in the first iteration, 1 in the second iteration, 2 in the third iteration and 3 in the fourth iteration. And then it is going to print C. After that it is not like that it is going to be a backslash C and it is going to have percent as that is going to grab the value from this C and how it is going to grab these uh, values is basically going to be using this we are going to write in R comma C. So this R over here is going to be printed right over here and this C value is going to be printed right in place of this C and this R is going to be printed as it is. So when the code run you are going to understand it much more easily. We are going to specify for now the border width. So the border width is going to be 1 and after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write in label dot grid the main thing which we are going to use. So we are going to write in row equal to R and the column is going to equal to C. So finally we are going to move out of this loops and we are going to write in root dot main loop. So let's just run this code and then you are going to understand it much more easily. Alright as you can see right here that you have got r0 slash c0. So this r has been printed as it is as you can see. 
this zero over here is basically the value of this first iteration since it is going to be zero in the first case so it is going to grab this value right from here and it is going to place in in, in place of this percent s so that is going to be zero then you have got a backslash c as it is and then this zero is going to have the value of this column that is for this inner loop that is going to start from zero and iterate till four so it is going to have this zero over here so this basically produced a result that is displaying 12 label that is that are arranged in a 3 multiply by 4 grid and as I told you about the grid management that this basically organizes widgets in a table like structure in the parent window so here the parent window is root and as you can see right here that you have got a table like structure in which you have got a 3 cross 4 grid so this is how basically the grid manager works in Tickenter. so let's move on to the final manager we have got that is the place method and as I told you before that this geometry manager organizes widgets by placing them in a specific position in a parent widget the syntax for that is written right in front of you that is widget dot place and then you have got place options and in the place options you have got the first one is anchor now the exact spot of a widget other options refer to maybe the northeast southwest northeast northwest southeast or southwest that are the compass direction indicating the corners and sides of a widget. The default value for that is northwest, that is the upper left corner of a widget. Then we have got the second option as border mode. Insight for that is the default value, that is to indicate that other option refer to the parent's inside, ignoring the parent's border. Outside is going to be the otherwise value of it. Then you have got the height and width, that are the height and width in pixels, simple enough. Then you have got the REL width and the REL height that are the height and width as a float between 0.0, .0 and 1.0 as a fraction of the height and width of the parent window. Then we have got RELX, RELY that are the horizontal and vertical offsets as a float between 0.0, .0 and 1.0 as a fraction of the height and width of the parent window. And finally we have got XY that are the horizontal and vertical offsets in pixels. So all of these values basically are going to help us to place a widget in a specific position in a parent window which is exactly what the place managers do in Tickenter. So let's just see an example of this as well. So we will move on to the compiler again and we are going to remove this inner stuff from here. And right here what we are going to do is that we are going to create a button that is going to equal to button we are going to add it to the root window and the text on this button is going to equal to let's say hi and now what we are going to do is that using the object through which we have created the button we are going to use the manager that is the place manager and right here we are going to write an x equal to let's say 20 and y equal to 20 so we have used the coordinates where we want to place this button and as I told you about the place manager that place manager is used to place a widget at a certain location in a root window. So that is exactly what we are going to do here we are going to place this button which we have created and using the object of this button we are going to specify the position where we want to place this button that is x equal to 20 and y equal to 20. So if I just run this code can see right here that you have got this button that says hi and you can see that it has been positioned at a certain location that is 2020 you cannot measure it but rest assured this is the position that is x equal to 20 and y equal to 20 so this is how basically the place manager can be used so we have covered all the three managers we started on with the pack manager then we covered the grid manager and finally we have covered the uh, last one that was the place manager. So I hope that you have understood all of these three managers and this is how basically the geometry management for widgets is done in Tickenter. So I guess that is it for this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tickenter module in Python and in this tutorial we are going to cover the third part for the Tickenter standard attributes. So in the previous tutorial we have covered certain standard attributes so in this tutorial we are going to continue on with that and we are going to cover the remaining standard attributes. So let's just start on with relief styles. 
So relief style of a widget basically refers to a certain simulated 3D effects around the outside of a widget. So if you talk about a list of possible constants which can be used for relief attributes then these are listed right in front of you. The first one is flat, then we have got raised, then we have got sunken, then we have got groove and then finally we have got a ridge. So let's just see an example for how they are going to be used. So we will move on to our compiler and this is the code which we have from our previous tutorial. The simplest thing we are going to do is that we are going to create a button. Let's just create it as B1 and it is going to equal to the function that is used to create a button. It is going to be added to the root window and the text on this button is going to equal to high. And what we are going to do next is that we are going to specify the relief for that and let's say the relief for that is the first one that is flat. So let's just have the have this code run. All right, we have not specified any kind of geometry manager, so that's why it is not, I guess, showing output. So let's just write in b1 dot place and let's say it is at position 10 and y equal to 10 as well. Let's just now run it and now it is going to pop up. All right, so now you can see that it is a button, but as you can see that it is not showing any kind of border because the relief we have specified is flat. So if we just change it to, let's say raised, and now we run this code, you're going to see now that this button is kind of raised. So this is the relief style for that. Then you can also go on and use the third one that is the run this code and you are going to see that it is now a bit of kind of gone inside type of. So this is how basically you can use the relief styles in Tikinter. The next thing that we have over here is basically the bitmaps. So this attribute to, uh, to display bitmaps is a certain kind of this. The first one is error, then we have got gray 75, gray 50, Gray 25, Gray 12, Horgelas, Info, Quest Head, Question, and finally we have got Warning. So let's just see how bitmaps is going to work. So we are going to use the very same button and what we are going to do is that we are going to have bitmap over here. And let's say the first one was error. So let's just use error over here run this code and as you can see that in place of this text high now it is showing this kind of error uh, kind of thing because the bitmap we have used is error over here. So you can use any of these let's just say we want to use the hard glass so we are going to yeah, write in R glass and let's just run this code and you can see that this is the R glass. Then you can use, let's say, the warning. Run this code. And you can, you can see that you have got this exclamation mark that is used for warning. So you can use any of these. You can use the question. You can use the grade 12, grade 25, grade 50, grade 75. Let's just use one of these that is, let's say, gray, And let's just use 50. So run this code and it is going to be gray 50. So this is how basically bitmaps works. So let's just move on to the next one. That is the cursors. So Python Tikinter supports quite a number of different mouse cursor available. The exact graphic may vary according to your operating system. So some of these include the arrow, the circle, the clock, the cross, the dot box, exchange, flare, heart, man and we have got I guess multiple mans then we have got mouse then we have got pirate then we have got plus then we have got shuttle then we have got sizing we have got spider we have got spray can we have got star we have got target we have got t cross and we have got track and we have got watch as well 
So let's just see an example for how this is going to be done. So we are going to move back to our compiler. So we will just remove these two from here. And right here what we are going to do is that we are going to write in cursor equal to the first one that was I guess circle. So let's just run this code. And you can see the normal button but if you hover your mouse over it you can see that the cursor changes to a circle. So you can just use any of these uh, styles I have just uh, explained in the slide. You can just go on and use the add, run this code. It was not add, it was going to be plus. Now run this code. And now you can see that if you hover your mouse over it, it changes to a plus sign. So this is how it works. You can use any of that. You can use the spider, the mouse, the pirate, the shuttle, the sizing. You can use any of the style I have specified in the slide. So I hope that you have understood these standard attributes we have covered in this tutorial. So for this tutorial, I guess that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tikintra module in Python. Now in this tutorial we are going to cover the second part for buttons and the first thing we are going to do in this tutorial is that we are going to see what is a callback function. So up till now we have been only creating buttons but we have not been attaching any kind of code behind that so when we click on the button nothing happens. But in this tutorial what we are going to do is that when we click on a button something is going to happen. So the existing button does not do anything when it is clicked upon. We can change that by adding a callback function to the program. So this is basically a two step process. The first one is that you have to define the callback and the second process is that you have to pass the callback to the button. So let's just see an example for how that is going to be done. So right here we are going to create a button that is going to add it to the root window and the text on the button is going to say click me. And the next thing we are going to specify is basically going to be command and command is basically going to be the name of the function which is going to get called when this button is going to be clicked. So let's say the name of the function is callback. So for now it has got a red line because we have not specified this button. So we are going to write in button dot back and right here we are going to define our function that is callback. And in this function, we are going to simply print a button was clicked. Simple enough. Now what we have to do is that we have to move it to the top right here. And that is going to remove that red line because as you know that a code always follows a sequential order. So when this code is following a sequential order and if this line over here is at the top, before this then what is going to happen is that it is not going to recognize that if this callback function has been initialized or not. But if it is at the top it is going to execute first it is going to store it in its memory that the function name callback exists and when we define this function and we write in the command equal to callback this is when this, this button named click me is going to be clicked this function named callback is going to be called and whatever is right written inside this function is going to be executed. So let's just run this code. All right, so as you can see that you have got this button that says click me. If you click on this button and we just move this console a bit up, you can see that it says a button was clicked. So this is how it is going to execute the callback function. So I hope that you have understood how to define a callback function. Now there is one more method of how you can do this is by using the optional callback configuration. That is instead of passing the callback as a command to the button constructor, you may instead use the dot config method to do the very same job we have done right over here. So right here, if you just remove this command from here and you have got your function that is callback that says print a button was clicked and then you've got the button created, then you've got the pack method and right after this, what you're going to do is Using this object through which you have created your button, you are going to write in button dot config and in the config you are going to specify the command that is going to equal to the name of the function you want to call in that is callback. So if you now run this code, 
you can see the button that says click me click on the button move it up and you can see that it again says a button was click so this is the second method of how you can just have your callback function called then you've got one more function that is known as the invoke function so it is possible to invoke the button as if someone has clicked it using the dot invoke button in this what we do is we make the program virtually click the button this can be useful if you need to execute a callback method from more than one place in your code because you only need to configure it once and that's why that's when you are defining this button so right here you have got everything what you are going to do after this configuration part is that you are going to write in for i in range and let's say i want to call this button let's say five times i'm going to write in button dot invoke and then we have got this root dot main loop let's just move it a bit up so that everything is visible now let's just run this code and you're going to understand what is going on all right we have to ex stop the previous code we just i guess forgot to stop the previous code let's just cross it and now run this code all right we have got this button that says click me click on this button and as you can see that it says click a button was clicked again click it so this is I guess executing this button five times but I guess it is not displaying the output like that as far as I guess we have to remove these brackets from here I guess because this is stopping this code from invoking it again and again let's just now run this code and yes we have got the output we require you can see that the button was invoked automatically five times even without clicking the button. You can see that I have not clicked on this button after I've run this code but as you can see that I've got five times a button was clicked. This means that it was invoked automatically without without allowing you to click actually. If I click now on this button you can see that the sixth time of this a button was clicked has been displayed over here but this five times this uh, a button was clicked was displayed. I did not click the button it displayed itself using the invoke method if I click on it again it is going to display one more time button was clicked similarly if I keep on clicking on it it is going to keep displaying a button was clicked as you can see that I have clicked it multiple times so that's why I've got multiple times a button was clicked so this is how basically the invoke method works the next thing we are going to do in this tutorial is that we are going to see how we can add an image to a button so we are going to do it right over here so one way to make the button more appealing in the application is to use an image just like with the label you first need to create it using the photo image constructor this constructor is going to take the argument of the part to the image which we want to add to the button with the logo object created we can use the config method on the button to set the image property to that logo so in here what we are going to do is that we are going to have a button and the button is to be the is to be to the left of the text another method of the photo image object that we can use to resize images within tkinter is called subsample you pass in an x and y and it will use the x and every y pixel in each direction so let's just code that we will just remove this from here we don't need to call it and right over here what we are going to do is that we are going to write in logo and we are going to use the photo image constructor so we are going to write in photo image and we are going to specify the file name which we are going to use so as you can see right over here in the directory of this python tutorials that i've already added a file named calc.gif so we are going to write in calc.gif over here one thing i need to remind you over here is that i have tried this with the jpg format and the other the png format but it is not working with that it is only working with the gif format i don't know why i guess it may be a problem with my compiler you can just go on and try with the other formats but for my compiler only the gif format for adding image to a button is working so that's why i'm doing it with the gif format and that's why i've got a gif image so we have got this now the next thing we are going to do is that we are going to write in button dot config and we are going to config it with the image we have added so we are going to write an image equal to logo which is actually having our image calc.gif and 
what we are going to do is that we are going to write in compound equal to left as I told you that this button is going to be at the left side and it is going to be compound all right now what we are going to do is that we are going to use the subsample method which as I told you about is that it is basically used to resize images within Tkinter. So what we are going to do is that we are going to write in x equal to logo dot subsample and in the subsample method we are going to specify the x and y pixel and as I told you that you are going to pass in the x and y and it will use the x and every y pixel in each direction. So let's say we just write in 2 and 2 or let's just make it a bit big because the image is I guess a bit big. So let's just make it to 7 7 and then we are going to config it. So we are going to write in button dot config and this time we are going to write an image equal to x and finally we have got our root dot main loop already there. So let's just run this code. Alright so as you can see that we have got this button but I guess this is a very big image. You can just go on and change the x and y uh, location which we have specified over here and I guess that is going to make this a bit small. So as you can see that this is the complete button. You can see that this is the bordering of the button and at the right side we have got the text that says click me and at the left side we have got this image. You can see that if I click on this button this is actually a button but since we have got as you can see that you have got a button was clicked over here as well since we have clicked it multiple times. So that is how it is actually working. You can just go on and change the size and I guess that will help you reduce the size of the image. Let's just run this code now. And you can see that the image is now a bit in a good position. Let's just make it to 1515 and that is going to make it even smaller. All right, that is much better. Let's just make it to 30. 30 and I guess that is going to solve our problem. So yes kind of this has kind of solved our problem. You can see that this is now a reasonable button but if you still want to just smallen this image you can just go on and make this equal to 40 40 and that is going to do your job. So I hope that you have understood how to resize your image and how you are going to add image to a button. So the next part of the tutorial is about how to disable a buttons. Now buttons have a state which determine whether they are active and if they can be used or if they are disabled and unstable. To set the state of a widget use the state method to modify the disabled flag. So what you can simply do is that you will just remove this from or just let it be and you can just write in button dot state and you're going to have these uh, square brackets and in the square brackets you can simply write in disabled and that is going to have your button disabled. So let's just run this code. I guess we've got some problem that says button object has no attribute named state. I guess we have to import the TTK over here so let's just write in from tkinter import ttk and I guess that is going to solve our problem has it? No it has not and I guess the reason behind this is that we have imported the ttk but the button it has been created using the normal tk so we are going to write in ttk dot button and I guess yes this has now solved our problem so let's just run this code and as you can see that you have this button and this button as you can see is kind of gray which means that this button is disabled and as you can see that if I click on this button nothing is happening and if you just have a look at this console you can see that nothing has been printed over here even when I'm clicking this button because the state of the button is now disabled. Then there is one more method that is known as the in state method that is used to check the current state of a button. So how that is going to work? Now as you can see that you have specified the state of the button to be disabled. So right here if you want to just check the button state. You can just write in button state equal to button dot 
in state and you can just see if the button is disabled or not similarly you can just go on and print the button state and similarly you can just go on and write in button state one and that is going to equal to button dot dot in state and that is going to be negation of disabled which means that it is kind of enabled and similarly you can just go on and print that as well that is button state one so just run this code and you're going to understand what is going on so as you can see that the first one says true because in that we are printing the button state which is which says that the button state is at this time disabled since we have disabled the button as you can see right here so since the button is disabled so that's why this statement over here when we print it it is going to generate true whereas the negation of true is enabled but button state is not enabled so that's why it is going to generate false that is the output of this second print statement so if you just remove this line from here run this code then the output of here is going to be changed it is going to be then false true so if you just run this code stop and rerun all right as you can see that you have got false now and true now because the button is now enabled this thing over here is going to be false and this thing over here is going to be true so this is how you can check the state of a button whether it is disabled or enabled so i hope that you have understood each and every topic we have covered in this tutorial this was a lengthy tutorial and we have covered a lot of things in this tutorial we started on with how to define a callback function then we see how to call a function using the config method that was the optional callback configuration then we call the button using the invoke button that was to call a button without even clicking it then we see how to add a gif image to a button then we see how to disable a button and then we see how to check the state of a button whether it is enabled or disabled. So I hope that you have understood all of these topics regarding buttons. So that is it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tikinter module in Python and in this tutorial we are going to talk about the Tikinter canvas. So basically the canvas is kind of a rectangular area that is intended for drawing pictures or other complex layouts. So basically you can place graphics, you can place text, you can place widgets or you can place frames on top of the canvas. So if you talk about the syntax of a canvas it is listed right in front of you. It is canvas then we have got master that represents the parent window which is root in our case and then you have got options so options are basically a list of things so the options that include this canvas parameter or you can say the syntax of this includes bd that is used to represent the border width in pixels the default value for the border width is equal to 2 so then we have got bg that is used to represent the normal background color then we have got confine and the value of confine is true by default the canvas cannot be scrolled outside of the scroll region then we have got the cursor we have already covered we have already talked about cursor in the tikinder standard attributes and this is basically used to represent the cursor in a canvas like it can be an arrow it can be a circle it can be a dot it can be a plus sign or a lot of other things which we have covered in the Tikinder standard attributes you can just go on and review that options and you can use the cursor of your own choice then we have got height that is used to size the canvas in the y dimension then we have got the highlight color that is the color that is shown in the focus highlight then we have got relief that is the relief specify the type of the border which we have already covered and you know that it includes the flat it includes the sunken it includes the raised group and the ridge we've already talked about relief as well in the standard attributes of the canter then some other options include the width 
that is the size of the canvas in the x dimension then we have got the scroll region that is a tuple that can be west north east or south that defines over how large an area the canvas can be scrolled where w is the left side n is the top side e is the right side and s is the bottom side then we have got the x scroll increment that is if you set this option to some positive dimension the canvas can be positioned only on mul multiples of the of that distance and the value will be used for scrolling by scrolling units such as when the user clicks on the arrow at the end of a scroll bar then we have got x scroll command that is if the canvas is scrollable this attribute should be the dot set method of the horizontal scroll bar and then similarly we have got y scroll increment that works like the x scroll inc increment but it governs the vertical movement and then we have got the y scroll command that works like the x scroll command but here if the canvas is scrollable this attribute should be the dot set method of the vertical scroll bar which was for the horizontal scroll bar in case of x scroll increment so these are some of the options that can be used so if you talk about the standard items that are supported then the canvas widget can support some standard item as well the first one of that is known as the arc it basically creates an arc which can be a chord a kind of pie slice or a simple arc what you have to do is that you have to specify the coordinates and then the create arc function is going to create that arc using those specific coordinates you specify then you have got image that is used to create an image item which can be an instance of either the bit map image or the photo image class and right here what you have to do is that you have to use the photo image class and you have to specify the image you want to use and then the create image function of the canvas class is going to help you to create an image then we have got line that is used to create a line item the create line function from the canvas class is used to create the line you have to specify the coordinates from where you want to start on the line and the y coordinates are also going to be specified for that then we have got the oval that creates a circle or an eclipse at the given coordinates now basically the oval class basically takes two pair of coordinates the top left and the bottom right corners of the bounding rectangles for the oval the create oval function from the canvas class is used to create this then we have got polygon that is used to create a polygon item that must have at least three vertices and then the create polygon function is used from the canvas class to create a polygon so let's just move finally to the example part and see how we are going to create some arc and we are going to have eclipses and we are going to create certain shapes on the canvas finally so let's just move on to the compiler and here we have the code that is the root window created we have imported tkinter and we have got root.main loop over here what we are going to do is that we are going to write in c equal to canvas and this canvas is going to be added to the root window we are going to specify the background color for the canvas that is going to be let's say blue you can have the color of your own choice then we are going to specify the height to be 250 and we are going to specify the width to be 300 now as I told you about the creation of arc I told you that first you have to specify the coordinates and then you are going to use the create arc function from the canvas class to create a arc so what we are going to do is that we are going to write in quart that specify the coordinates and we are going to make it equal to 10 50 240 and 210 so these are the coordinates through which we are going to create our arc so now what we are going to do is that we are going to write an arc equal to c dot create arc so basically c represents the canvas this is the object which we have used right over here and this is the function that is used to create an arc and we are going to create arc using the coordinates i told you which we have specified right over here 
So we are going to write in quad. We are going to specify the starting point to be zero. The extent is going to equal to 150. And finally, we are going to write in fill equal to the color which we want this arc to be. So let's say it is going to be red. And finally, we are going to pack the canvas the very same way we pack buttons. So basically, geometry management comes into account here. So let's just run this code and let's just hope that it works perfectly. All right, as you can see that it has worked perfectly and you can see that we have got an, a kind of an image or you can you cannot call it an image because it is uh, used, created using the create arc function. So this is an arc that starts from the zeroth position and then it moves towards the 10th position, then it moves towards the 50 position, then the 240 and then the 210 position. So that's why it is, that's how it is created and the fill right, you can see that the arc within is right. So if you just, let's say change the coordinates, let's say I want, just want to make it 220, 210 does not sound good to me. Run this code and you can see that it has been, a, it is a bit bigger from the previous arc. Let's just make it a big value so that the change that is made to this is much more clearer. You can see now that the arc is now much more bigger. You can just go on and change this value as well. Let's say, just say I want to make it equal to 200. Run this code and you can see that the arc shape has been changed slightly. So you can have these coordinates of your own choice depending upon the arc which you want to create. So this is how basically the create arc function is used to create an arc in the canvas. Then what you can also do is that you can have multiple shapes as well. So let's say I want to have a line created and I also want to create an oval. So I'm going to use the very same canvas and I'm going to just remove these lines from here and I'm going to write in line equal to c dot create line function and in the create line function as I told you that we are going to specify the x naught and y naught that are the starting position of the line and then the y not y1 and x y uh, x1 and y1 that are going to specify the ending position of the line because the line is going to start from a specific x y coordinate and it is going to end on a specific x y coordinate so we are going to specify the first coordinates that are the starting position so these two coordinates are basically the starting position of the line that is x equal to 108 and y equal to 120 so this is where the line is going to start from and we want to make it equal to 320 and 40. So these are the coordinates to which I want to extend my line. So the line is going to start from x equal to 108, y equal to 120 and it is going to extend to x equal to 320 and y equal to 40. So this is how our line is going to be created and we are also going to specify the fill for that. That is going to be the color of the line in that case. So we are going to write in fill equal to red because red is the color that is going to be shown in place of the line. Then we can just go on and create an oval as well. So for that we are going to write in c dot create oval function. And in that oval function creation, what we will do is that we are going to specify x0, y0, x1, and y1. And we are going to also specify certain options as well. So let's just say it is going to be 80, 30 that are x0 and y0, and then 140 and 150. And the fill for that is going to equal to, let's say, green. So we have already got c dot pack and root dot main loop over here. So let's just run this code. As you can see that you've got uh, an oval that is having these coordinates that are 80 and 30 are the starting position of the oval and 140 and 150 are the ending position of that oval. And then the fill is green as you can see that the color is green and then you have got the line. The starting position are x equal to 108 and y equal to 120 and the ending position are 320 and 40. So this is how they are basically created in the canvas. So I hope that you have understood how to create a line and how to create an oval.
to be simple and to be specific, you know how now to work with Canvas. So that was what was the purpose of this tutorial. So I hope that you have understood that. So that is it, I guess, with this tutorial. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. And I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tikenter module in Python. And in this tutorial, we are going to talk about the Tikenter check button. Now, the check button widget is used to display a number of options to a user as toggle buttons. The user can then select one or more options by clicking the button corresponding to each option. If you talk about the syntax for how it is going to be used, then it is listed right in front of you. You have to write in check button. And check button is basically the function that is going to make the check button for you that is from the tick and tech class. So in here you have got two options. The first one is master that represents the parent window. And then you have got options that is the list of options that is available with the check button widget. So if you talk about these options, they are a lot in number. The first one is active background. Then active background is basically used to check the background color when the check button is under the cursor because it is known as the active background color. So whenever you hover your mouse upon the check button, the color that is going to be displayed is going to be initialized using this active background. And similarly, the active foreground color has the very same explanation. It is going to have the foreground color when the check button is under the cursor. Then you have got BG, the normal background color that is displayed behind the label and the indicator. Then you have got bitmap that is to display a monochrome image on a button. Then you have got BD, that is the size of the border around the indicator. Now the default value for BD is 2 pixels. Then we have got command, that is a procedure to be called every time the user changes the state of this check button. Then we have got cursor that is if you set this option to a name that can be arrow or dot or a plus sign the mouse cursor will change to that pattern when it is over the check button. Some other options include the disabled foreground color, the font. So in the disabled foreground color the foreground color used to render the text of a disabled check button. The default is a stippled version of the default foreground color. Then we have got font, that is the font that is used for the text. Then we have got foreground, that is the color used to render the text. Then we have got height, that is the number of lines of text on the check button. The default value for this is 1. Then we have got highlight color, that is the color of the focus highlight when the check button has the focus. And then we have got image, that is to display a graphic image on the button. Then we have got justify. That is, if the text contain multiple lines, this option control how the text is going to be justified. That can be at the centered, it can be at the left side, or it can be right justified. Some other options include the off value. The off value normally is basically a check button associated control variable that will be set to zero when it is cleared. So you can supply an alternate value for the off state by setting the off value to that value. Then we have got the on value that is normally a check button associated control variable that will be set to 1 when it is set on. You can supply an alternate value for the on state by setting the on value to that value. Then we have got the pad x and pad y. Pad x basically determines how much space to leave to the left and right of the check button and text. The default is one pixel. Similarly, pad y determines how much space to leave above and below the check button and text and the very same the default value for that is also one pixel. Then we have got relief with the default value relief equal to flat. The check button does not stand out from its background. You may set this option to any of the other styles. Then we have got select color that is the color of the check button when it is set. Default is the select color is red. Then we have got select image that is if you set this option to an image that image is going to appear in the check button when it is set. So some other option includes the state. The default value for state is normal but you can use the state as disabled to gray out the control and make it unresponsive. Now if the cursor is currently over the check button the state is going to be active. Then we have got text the label that is displayed next to the check button. So you can use new lines to display multiple lines of text and to 
denote your check button. Then we have got underline. Now with the default value of minus one, none of the characters of the text labels are going to be underlined. You are going to set this option to the index of a character in the text counting from zero to underline that character. Then we have got variable, the control variable that tracks the current state of the check button. Normally this variable is an int var and zero means cleared and one means set but to see the off value and on value options above as well. Then we have got width. The default width of a check button is going to be determined by the size of the displayed image or it can be displayed or it can be determined by the size of the text. You can set this option to a number of characters and the check button will always have room for that many characters. Then we have got finally the wrap length. Normally lines are not wrapped. You can set this option to a number of characters and all lines will be broken into pieces no longer than that number. Then comes certain methods that are associated with this check button as well. The first one of that is the deselect that clear or turns off the check button. Then you have got flash that flashes the check button a few times be between its active and normal colors but leave it the way it started. Then we have got invoke. You can call this method to get the same actions that would occur if the user clicked on the check button to change its state. Then we have got select that is to set or turn on the check button. And finally, we have got the toggle that clears the check button if set and it set it if it is clear. In other words, whatever is the state of the button, it is going to inverse that state. So I hope that you have understood every kind of option, every kind of method that is associated with a check button. So let's just move on to solve some examples. So we are going to move to our compiler where we already have imported the Kinter. So what we will do is that we are going to create our root window. So we are going to write in root equal to TK. And we are going to determine the geometry for that. So we are going to write in root dot geometry. And let's say it is a 200 by 200 geometry. Then what we are going to do is that we are going to have the check button status. So we are going to write and check BTN status that is going to check if the button is in the active state or not. And for sure that is going to be a Boolean variable. So we are going to write in Boolean. I did not minimize that. So it is going to be boolean variable after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write and check BDN status dot set so we are going to set this initially to true after that what we are going to do is that we are going to create our check button so we are going to write and check button equal to check button that is the class that is good sorry the function that is going to create your or you can just have it uh, the class because we are calling the constructor here so that's why you can just call it the class so this is the check button class that is going check button class that is going to create the check button for you we are going to add it to the root window the text on the button is going to equal to checkbox and the variable is going to equal to check button status. After that, we are also going to write in command equal to a function. So we are going to call a function named as func. So that is also going to get called. After that, what we are going to do is for now, let's just ignore it and let's just create a simple button. And after that, we are going to have the callback function as well. So after that, what we are going to do is that we are going to define the check button dot grid. And we are going to write in column zero, row zero. And that is going to do our job. So all we have to do now is that we have to write in root dot main loop. And that is going to do our job, I guess. So let's just run this code and see what happens. All 
all right it has generated an output it has just minimized i don't know why all right so here it is you can see that you have got a check box that has already been checked so it means that the default state of a checkbox is that it will be checked already now what you can do to deselect it is that you are going to use this object that is known as check button and what you will do is that you can just go on and deselect that button so for that what we will do is that after a Specifying this grid right down here. We are going to write in check button dot deselect and After that our main loop is going to execute. So if I now run this code You're going to see that the checkbox is not checked this time So this was the method that was associated with the check button. That is the deselect method now if I just after that I just write in check button dot select and I run this code you're going to see that it is going to be checked now the reason behind this is that it was checked by default after this command was executed it was deselected but after that we have got this command so this command is going to again select this check button if I just move it to the top I just remove it from here and I just paste it over here and run this code now you're going to see that the button is not checked now because it was just selected by default this button was also to select that but the last line that was executed was to deselect that check button so that's why it has been not checked this time all right then comes the toggle button so the toggle function and you can just write in check button dot toggle and you know that since this is the last line that was executed so this means that the button is going to be deselected but since as i told you about the explanation in toggle i told you that toggle is going to inverse whatever the state of the button is so that's why when it since it is going to be deselected since the last function that is executed is deselect so toggle is going to select it so as you can see that it has been selected so now if I just remove it from here, which means that the button is now going to be selected and I run this code now you can see that it is not checked. Now the reason behind this is that it was selected, toggle inverts the state of the check button and it is not checked now. So I hope that you have understood what I am going, what I'm doing here. Now comes the callback function. So let's just now go on with the callback function. So we are going to write in command equal to func and right at the top here we are going to write in the function named as func and in this we are going to simply 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 print out check box. Alright so let's just run this code. All right, as you can see, if I check this button, you can see that this checkbox appeared right over here. So if I deselect it, it is again going to print this checkbox. So whenever I select or deselect it, a checkbox message is going to be printed right over here. As you can see that since I have deselected and selected it multiple times. So that's why we have got these things multiple times over here. So I hope that you have understood what a check button is, how the functions associated with the check button works and how you can have the callback function for the check button. So I guess for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tikintra module in Python. And in this tutorial, we are going to talk about the entry widget. The entry widget is basically used to accept a single line text string from a user. If you want to display multiple line of text that can be edited, then you should use the text widget. If you want to display one or more lines of text that cannot be modified by the user, then you can just go on and use the label widget. Then comes the part where we are going to discuss the syntax. So it is listed right in front of you. It is as simple. You can just try, you have to just write in entry. You have to write in master options. Master basically represents the parent window as usual and options are basically the parameters which you can use with this entry widget. So let's just discuss these options. The first one is the background color. 
that is the normal background color displayed behind the label and indicator. Then we have got BD that represents the border width. The default value for this is 2 pixels. Then we have got command that is a procedure to be called every time the user changes the state of the check button. Then we have got cursor that is if you set this option to cursor name the mouse cursor will change to that pattern where it is over the check button. Then we have got the font that is the font used for the check for that is used for the text button. Then we have got export selection by default if you select text within an entry widget it is automatically exported to the clipboard. To avoid this exportation you have to use export selection equal to zero which means that it is not going to import anything then. Then comes the FG that is the color used to render the text. Some other options include the highlight color that is the color of the focus highlight when the check button has the focus. Then comes the justify that is if this if the text contain multiple lines this option control how the text is going to be justified in the entry widget. Then comes the relief and the very same the default value is flat. Then comes the select background color that is the background color to that is used to display selected text then comes the select border width that is the background color to use for displaying selected text. Then comes the select foreground that is to select the foreground color of the selected text. Then comes the show that is uh, normally the characters that the user type appears in the entry to make a password entry that equals each character as a steric you have to write in set show equal to steric. Then comes the option state. Now the default value for state is normal but you can use state equal to disable to gray out the control and make it unresponsive. Then comes the text variable. Now in order to be able to retrieve the current text from your entry widget you must set this option to an instance of the string variable class. Then comes the width that defines the width of the entry widget. Then comes the x scroll command that is if you expect that user will often enter more text than the on screen size of the widget you can link your entry widget to a scroll bar as well. Then there are a lot of methods that are associated with this entry widget as well. The first one is delete where the first parameter is first letter you want to delete where you want to start deleting and last is the element where you want to stop deleting. So delete function basically delete characters from the widget starting from the one at index number one up to the element that is not including the character at position last. So if the second argument is omitted only the single character at position first is going to get deleted. Then comes the get function that returns the entries current text as a string. Then we have i cursor that has one parameter named as index that set the insertion cursor just before the character at the given index. Then we have got index that takes in index as a parameter as well that shifts the content of the entry so that the characters at the given index is the leftmost visible character. Now it has no effect if the text fits entirely within the entry widget. Then comes the insert that takes in two parameters. The first one is index and the second one is s. Now it insert a string s before the character at the given index. Then we have got select adjust that takes in one parameter and name it as index. Now this method is used to make sure that the selection includes the character at the specified index. Then we have got select clear that clears the selection. Now if there is not currently a selection then this function has no effect. Then some other methods include the select from and it also takes in one parameter named as index and it sets the anchor index position to the character selected by index and selects that character. Then we have got select present that is if there is a selection it returns true else it is going to return false. Then we have got select range that takes in two parameters start and end. It sets the selection under the program control. It selects this text starting at the start index up to but not included the, including the character at the end index. The start position uh, must be before the end position. 
Then we have got the select to that takes in one parameter index that selects all the text from the anchor position up to but not including the character at the given index. And then we have got x view that takes in one parameter named as index. And this method is useful in linking the entry widget to a horizontal scroll bar. And finally, we have got x view scroll that takes in two parameters number and what. Now it is used to use use it is used basically to scroll the entry in the horizontal direction. Now the what argument must be either units to scroll by character widths or pages to scroll by chunks the size of the entry widget. Now the number is positive to scroll left to right, negative to scroll right to left. So if you want to scroll from left to right, you have to specify a positive number. And if you want to spec if you want to scroll from right to left, then you have to specify a negative parameter, negative number as an argument. So I hope that you have understood all the options. You have understood all the functions that are associated with this entry widget. And I hope that you can just go on and use them as well. But let me give you a quick example by myself as well. So we have got Tkinter imported, we have got a root window created, we have got a geometry as well and we have got root.main loop as well. So what we will do is that we are going to create a label number one and we are going to make it equal to label, we are going to add it to the root window and the text on that is going to equal to username. And we are going to write in label one dot back. And the side for that is going to equal to left. Then we are going to create an entry field. So we are going to make name it as entry number one. And it is going to equal to entry and it is going to add it to the root window. And the border width is going to equal to five. Now you if you want to use any other option which I have explained in the slides, I hope that you can just go on and use any of that if you want to change the background color, the foreground color, the border word, if you want to change the cursor, you can just go on and type in anything right over here and that is going to work completely fine. So that bd equal to 5, then what we can just do is that we can just write an entry one dot back. And the side for that is going to equal to right. And then we can just write in entry one dot insert. At the zeroth location, we are going to insert a default value, or you can just ask him to enter something. Then we are going to write an entry one dot or just we can just do it later. Let's just run this for now and then we are going to see what is going to happen. So we have used only one function over here that is the insert function and it takes in two parameters zero and at the zeroth location we are going to enter enter something. So let's just run this and see what is going to happen. All right, I guess we have got some kind of issue. All right, we have misspelled this site. All right, let's just rerun this. And yes, it is working perfectly fine. You can see that you have got username and in the bar you have got enter something. You can just remove it and you can write in whatever you want to do as well. So let's just minimize it for now. And let's say you just want to delete something from this enter something. And let's say you just want to have enter. You want just want to write in enter. So you what you will do is that you're going to write an entry one dot delete and you're going to start from the zeroth location until the sixth location and that is going to do your job. So let's just run this code and as you can see that you have got something only over here because the entries from zero till six includes this enter as well as the space so that has been deleted and all we have got is something over here. Then what you can do also is that you can use the get function as well. So you can just write an s equal to entry one dot get. And what get is going to do is that it is going to get 
whatever is present in the entry now for now we have got only something over here because we have deleted and enter and thing that is remaining is only this so if you just go on and print s run this code just scroll a bit up you can see that you have got something over here and if you just have a look here you also have got something over here so if you just remove this line from here that is deleting enter so run this code and you can see that now you have got enter something over here and enter something over here as well so that's how basically you can go on and use things so one more thing before i quit on with this tutorial was the effect which we were using right at the top something over here i guess that was for the show i guess so what we will do with that is that let's just move on to our compiler and right here for example we have a password entry and where it is it is right over here so we have got the label let's say as password so the label one is going to remain the very same it is going to be an entry root equal to pd equal to and what we will do with that is that we are going to make them equal to sterics because we don't because we don't want something to appear right in front of us when we are using the password so for that what we will do is that we are going to write in show equal to steric and what that is going to do is that whatever we write is going to be basically in sterics if i just run this code and show you what is going on you can see that you have got sterics right over here in here you have still got enter something because we are using the get function but in place of the password entry if you just remove it and write in something it is going to print sterics because password is something that has to be confidential and you don't want your password to be shown right in front of the screen when you are typing it so just remove it from here we don't need it anymore remove this from here as well and that is enough just run this and you are going to see the empty entry field where you can just go on and type a password so you can have multiple entry fields you can have a username you have a password you can you are going to have a password and let's say you can also have a button then and in the button you can when you click on that button it is going to get the username and password and it is going to match it with something or you can just do anything you want to do so i hope that you have understood the entry field you have understood the functions that are associated with the entry entry widget and i just hope that you just go on and try the other options as well as the other methods by yourself and if you feel any kind of problem feel free to ask so for me that is it i guess thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the tkinter module in python and in this tutorial we are going to discuss about the tkinter frame now we already have created frame in the previous tutorials but in this tutorial we will just have a look at the options that are associated because we have not covered the options in detail but we have already covered an example of how we are going to initialize frames so if you don't remember that example i am going to just remind you that in i guess tutorial number 9 or 10 where we were discussing the geometry management we have covered an example where we created four buttons and what three buttons were in the first row and one button was in the lower row there we actually created frames so if you don't remember you can just go on and have a look at that tutorial and that is going to explain frames to you in this tutorial we are only going to talk theoretically about the options that are associated with frames so if you talk about the syntax since you have already covered it so you already know it it is a simple frame then you have to write in master that represents the parent window and then you have got options now in the options the first one is the bg that represents the normal background color displayed behind the label and indicator then we have got bd that is the size of the border around the indicator and the default value for that is two pixels then we have got cursor and it has the very same implication that is if you set this option to a cursor name the mouse cursor will change to that pattern when it is over the frame then we have got height that is the vertical dimension of the new frame then we have got highlight background color that is the color of the focus highlight when the frame does not have focus some other options include the highlight color that is the color shown in the focus highlight when the frame has the focus then we have got highlight thickness 
that is the thickness of the focus highlight then we have got relief that is with the default value relief equal to flat the frame does not stand out from its background you may set this option to any of the other styles then we have got finally the width that is the default value of a frame that is determined by the size of the displayed image or text you can set this option to a number of characters and the frame will always have room for that many characters so i hope that you understood what options that are associated with the frame widget in tikenter so i guess that is it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching for the example you can just go on and refer to the geometry management and you're going to understand how frames can be used so thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the decanter module in python and in this tutorial we are going to talk about the decanter label now you must be thinking that we have created labels so many times so why we have to do this tutorial now it has the very same same reasons which was with the previous tutorial that we have to discuss the options that are associated with the decanter label so basically this widget implements a display box where you can place text or images the text displayed by this widget can be updated at any time you want it is also possible to underline part of the text like to identify a keyboard shortcut and span the text across multiple lines so you already know about the syntax of how to do this master represents the parent window and then comes the options which is the sole purpose of this tutorial that is to discuss the options that are associated with the tick intro label so let's just move on to the options the first option we have got is bg that represents the normal background color that is displayed behind the label and indicator then we have got a bitmap that is that sets this option equal to a bitmap or image object and the label will display that graphic then we have got anchor that should have that should be have been displayed at the bottom but let it be now this option basically controls where the text is positioned if the widget has more space than the text need the default for anchor is center which centers the text in the available space then comes bd that is the size of the border around the indicator where 2 is the default size for that then comes cursor that has the very same implication if you set this option to a cursor name the mouse cursor will change to that pattern when it is over the label then comes the font that is if you are displaying text in a label with the text or text variable option the font option specifies in what font that text is going to be displayed then comes the fg that is if you are displaying text or a bitmap in this label this option specifies the color of the text if you are displaying a bitmap this is the color that will appear at the position of the one bits in the bitmap then we have got height that is the vertical dimension of the label then comes some other options which includes image that is to display a static image in the label widget set this option to an image object then comes justify that specify how multiple lines of text will be aligned with respect to each other left for a left center for a centered that is default and right for right justified then comes the pad x and pad y with a small p not with a capital p pad x are for the extra space added to the left and right of the label within the widget that is default value with is one then comes pad y that is the extra space added above and below the text within the label and the default value for that is again one then comes relief that specify the appearance of a decorative border around the label the default is flat for other values then comes text with a small t that is to display one or more lines of text in a label widget you have to set this option to a string containing the text internal new lines will force a line break then comes the text variable that is to slave the text displayed in a label widget to a control variable of a class string variable and you have to set this option to that variable as well some other option includes the underline that is used to display an underline below the nth letter of the text counting from zero by setting this option to n the default is underline equal to minus one which means that no underlining will be done by default if you want to underline it you have to specify that then comes the width that is the width of the label in characters not in pixels 
If this option is not set, the label will be sized to fit its content. And finally, the last one is the wrap length. You can limit the number of characters in each line by setting this option to the desired number. The default value is zero means that the lines will be broken only at new lines. So we don't have to cover an example of this. So I hope you have understood all the options that are associated with this tick intro label. And I just hope that you are going to try them as well. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll be seeing you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the tick enter module in Python. And in this tutorial, we are going to talk about the tick enter list box. The list box widget is basically used to display a list of items from which a user can select a number of items. If you talk about the syntax of a list box, then it is listed right in front of you. It is the same as the previous ones, only the list box is going to be printed right over here. Master and options are going to remain the constant. Then in here, master represents the parent window and in the options, we have got a lot of things. The first one is the background color. That is the normal background color displayed behind the label and indicator. Then we have got the border width. We have got the cursor. We have got the font. And in here, the font is used for the text in the list box. Then we have got the foreground color. Then we have got the height. That is the number of lines, not the pixel shown in the list box. The default value for that is 10. Then we have got highlight color. That is the color shown in the focus highlight when the widget has the focus. Then we have got highlight thickness. That is the thickness of the focus highlight. Then we have got relief that select three dimensional border shading effects. The default for that is sunken. Then we have got select background. That is the background color to use displaying selected text. And then we have got select mode. That is something that is different from the previous options we have been covering so far. Now select mode basically determines how many items can be selected and how mouse drag affects the selection. Now there it has basically four kind of modes which you can go on and select. The first one is the browse mode. Normally you can only select one line out of a list box. If you click on an item and then drag to a different line, the selection will follow the mouse. This is the default. Then we have got the second mode that is known as the single mode. You can only select one line and you can drag the mouse wherever you click button one that line is selected. Then we have got the multiple mode in which you can select any number of line at once clicking on any line toggles whether or not it is selected. Then we have got these extended mode where you can select any adjacent group of lines at once by clicking on the first line and dragging to the last line. So this is something that is different from the previous widgets we have been covering so far. Then comes the width which has the very same explanation that is the width of the widget and characters. The default value for that is 20. Then we have got the x scroll command and the y scroll command. In the x scroll command if you want to allow the user to scroll the list box horizontally you can link your list box wizard to a horizontal scroll ball and if you want that same job to be done vertically then you can link your list box widget to a vertical scroll bar and y scroll command is going to do your job. Then there are a lot of methods also that are associated with the list box as well. The first one is the activate that takes in one argument that is known as index and it selects the line specified by the given index. Then we have got the cursor selection that returns a tuple containing the line number of the selected element or elements counting from zero. If nothing is selected, it is going to return an empty tuple. Then we have got the delete that takes in two arguments, the first and the last. It deletes the last, it deletes the lines whose indices are in the range of this first and last. If the second argument is omitted, the single line with index is going to get deleted. Then we have got the get method, which has the very same parameters, the first and the last. And it returns a tuple that contain the text of the line with indices from first to last inclusive. If the second argument is omitted, it returns the text of the line that is closest to the first. Then we have got index which takes in one argument i. If possible, positions the visible part of the list box so that the line containing the index i is at the top of the widget. Then we have got insert that takes in two argument. The first one is index. Then the second one is the element. It inserts one or more new lines into the list box before the line specified by index. 
you can just go on and use end as the first argument if you want to add new lines to the end of the list box. Then we have got the nearest which takes in one argument y. It returned the index of the visible line that is closest to the y coordinate y relative to the list box widget. Then we have got some other methods as well in which we have got the c that takes in one argument that is known as index and it basically adjusts the position of the list box so that the new line referred to by the index is visible. Then we have got size that returns the number of lines in the list box. Then we have got the x view that is to make the list box horizontally scrollable. Set the command option of the associated horizontal scroll bar to this method. Then we have got x view move to which takes in one argument known as fraction. Scroll the list box so that the leftmost fraction of the widget of the width of its longest line is outside the left side of the list box. Fraction is in the range of 0, 1. Then we have got the x view scroll that takes into argument number what. It scroll the list box horizontally. For the what argument, you can use either units to scroll by characters or you can use pages to scroll by pages. That is by the width of the list box. The number argument tells how many items to scroll that can be either pages or that can be other characters then we similarly we have got the y scroll y view move to and y view scroll the very same we have got the x view x view move to and x view scroll in the y view that is to make the list box scroll vertically and you have to set the command option of the associated vertical scroll bar to this method and in the y view move to fraction you have to it basically scroll the list box so that the top fraction of the width of its longest line is outside the left side of the list box and similarly the fraction is in the range of 0 1 and finally we have got the y view scroll number what it scroll the list box vertically for the what argument you can use units to scroll by lines or pages to scroll by pages that is by the height of the list box which was for the width of the list box in the x view scroll and the y view scroll basically it has the number argument which tells how many items to scroll vertically so i hope that you have understood all the options you have understood all the functions that are associated with the list box so let's just go on and see an example for how list box can be initialized in the compiler so here we are in our compiler where we already have our root window so what we will do is that we are going to write in we are going to since create a list box so let's just make it equal to lb equal to list box and we are going to add it to the root window and that is going to simply create our list box if you want to have any kind of implications to it you can just go on and change the background color you can change the foreground color you can change the cursor or whatever you want you can just use any of the options we have discussed in these slides so i will just leave it as simple so what we will do now is that we are going to insert elements into the list box so for that we are going to use the insert function so we are going to write in lb dot insert and insert takes in two argument the first one is going to be the index where you want to specify the element and the second one is going to be the element you want to specify or add at a specific location so let's say one is the location and let's say i just want to add in python so if since I've already got this root.main loop, all I need to do here is that I have to, to just write an lb dot back and just run this code and let's just see what happens. All right, as you can see that I've got a list box in which the first element I have got is Python. So this is how basically you can go on and add any number of elements. Let's say I would just want to add lb dot insert at the third location i want to let's say just add in c so if i just run this code you're going to see that i've got python and we have got c as well so let's just say i want to have lb dot insert at two i want to just insert in ruby run this code and you can see that you've got Python, you've got C and you've got Ruby. Now, if you can see that you must be thinking that since this is the second location, then the Ruby should be at the top and C should be at the bottom since C is at the third location. 
Yes, you are perfectly right. But that is when you are when you are going to print these elements, then you are going to print them according to that sequence. In here, they are going to appear in the sequence you have written them over here. So let's say you want to just add, you can just have lb dot insert. You can just specify this as end. And you can just write in, let's say, Perl. And you can just run this code and it is going to be inserted at the very end. You can see that you have got Perl at the very end. So this is how basically it works. So I hope that you have understood what is going on over here. And you can also use the delete method as well. For example, you want to delete an element. So you can just use the delete for that lb dot delete. You can just write in zero to the second location, run this code. And you can see that everything is missing besides this Perl because zero, one, two elements are going to be deleted. So I hope that you have understood how things are going to work. I just suggest that you go on and try the other functions as well. You know now the basic concept how you're going to create a list box. So I just said, so I suggest you to go on and try at least the X view scroll type of things. And you can just go on and see the size type of thing. For example, if you want to have the size here that is going to return the number of lines in the list box for just delete it for now just delete this one from here and we are going to create a variable known as s and i'm going to write an lb dot size and i'm going to just write in print s and if i just run this code you're going to see that i've got the size of the list box because the size function is going to return the size of the list box since it has got four elements so that's why the size here is four so that's how basically all the functions are going to work you can just go on and try them they are super easy so i hope that you have understood the list box concept so i guess that is it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the tkinter module in python and in this tutorial we are going to talk about the tkinter menu button so a menu button is a part of a drop down menu that stays on the screen all the time every menu button is associated with a menu widget that can display the choices for the menu button when the user clicks on it so if you talk about the syntax of this it is listed right in front of you it is the very same as you have to write in menu button and it is going to accept two parameters. The first one is going to be master that represents the parent window and then you have got certain options. So the options that are associated with the menu button widget are as PG. This should not be at the top. This should have started right from here. The first one is active background. So it represents basically the background color when the mouse is over the menu button. Then we have got the active foreground color. That is the foreground color when the mouse is over the menu button. Then we have got anchor. This option control when the text is positioned if the widget has more space than the text need. Default value for anchor is center which centers the text. And due to some animation problems we already have got BG and bitmap where BG is the normal background color displayed behind the label and indicator. Then we have got bitmap. That is to display a bitmap on the menu button. You have to set this option to a bitmap name. Then we have got BD that represents the border width. Default is two pixels. Then we have got cursor. The, that is the cursor that appears when the mouse is over the menu button. Some other options include the direction. You have to set the direction to left to display the menu to the left of the button. Use direction equal to right to display the menu to the right of the button. Or you can use direction equal to above to place the menu above the button. Then you have got disabled foreground and the foreground color shown on this menu button when it is disabled. Then we have got the FG that is the foreground color when the mouse is not over the menu button. Then we have got height. That is the height of the menu button in lines of text, not in terms of pixels. And the default is to fit the menu button size to its contents. Then we have got the highlight color. That is the color shown in the focus highlight when the widget has the focus. Then we have got image. That is to display an image on the menu button. 
Then we have got justify. That is this option control where the text is located when the text does not fill the menu button. You have to use justify equal to left to left justify the text. That is the default as well. And you have to use justify equal to center to center it and justify equal to right to justify it right. Then we have got some more option that includes the menu. And to associate the menu button with a set of choices, you have to set this option to the menu object containing those choices. That menu object must have been created by passing the associated menu button to the constructor as its first argument. Then we have got pad X and pad Y. Now pad X is going to define how much space to leave to the left and right of the text of the menu button. Default value is one. And pad Y is going to determine that how much space is to be left above and below the text of the menu button and the default value for this is also one. Then we have got relief that is to select three dimensional border sharing effect. The default is raised. Then we have got the state. Normally menu button responds to the mouse. Set state equal to disable to gray out the menu button and make it unresponsive. By default it is going to be responsive. Then we have got the text. To display text on the menu button set this option to the string containing the desired text. New lines within the strings will cause line breaks. Then we have got text variable. You can associate a control variable of class string var with this menu button. Settings that control variable will change the displayed text. Some other options include the underline. Normally no underline appears under the text on the menu button. To underline one of the character, set this option to the index of that character. Then we have got width, that is the width of the widget in character and the default value for that is 20. And finally we have got the last one that is the wrap length. Normally lines are not wrapped. You can set this option to a number of characters and all lines will be broken into pieces no longer than that number. So finally moving on to the example part where we are going to actually create a menu button. So we will move on to our compiler where we already have the setup. So in here we are going to create our menu button and we are going to use the options we have discussed in the slides. So right here we are going to write in MB that stands for menu button and we are going to write in menu button. This is going to get added to the root window. The text is as I told you what you want to appear on it. So it can be anything. Let's say you just want to have it as sports. And the relief for that is going to be raised. And after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write an MB dot grid. Now what you can also do is that you can specify the menu for that. So to add a menu what you can do is that you can just go on and add the menu over here as well. You can just write in menu equal to and you're going to specify the list of options. Let's say we are going to specify sports. So it is going to be cricket. It is going to be let's say hockey and I guess that's enough. Let's just see what happens. And finally, we are going to write an MB dot pack. So let's just run this code and see what happens. Just run Python. All right, we have got it minimized right over here. So in here you have got, as you can see, sports, but it is not displaying the menu. I guess some problem with it. All right, I guess we have to specify the menu not here. We can't specify it right here, but let's just say that after this grid, what you're going to do is that you're going to write an MB dot menu equal to menu. And that is going to get added to the MB that is the menu button. And the tier off for that is going to equal to zero. Then what we are going to do is that we are going to write an MB menu equal to MB dot menu 
and after that what we are going to do is that we are going to create our menu so we are going to write in correct menu or it is going to be a correct variable so it is going to equal to int var Similarly, we are going to have a foot variable that is going to be from the int var as well. And then what we are going to do is that we are going to write an mb.menu.add underscore check button. And the label for that is going to equal to cricket. And the variable we are going to use over here is going to be the quick variable we have specified. Then we are going to add one more button since we have specified one more variable. So we'll just copy this from here, paste it right over here. And this time it is going to equal to football. And it is going to be the foot variable we have specified. So I guess that is good enough. We have added the menu. We have already write, written mb.pack. Root.main loop is already here. So let's just run this code and see if the menu has been now added or not. Just click on sports and you can see that you have got the two menu which you have specified right over here. So I hope that you have understood it. Now what what's basically going on over here is that first we have created a menu button. So the menu button is basically what is showing on the screen right over here. That is this menu button that has this sports on it. After that, we have specified mb.grid that is going to place this button on this window we have specified. After that, what we are doing is that we are creating a menu. And what we will do is that we are going to add this, whatever menu we add to this menu button we have created using this object mb which is basically used to create the menu for us as you can see right here since this is a button you can see that this is a menu button and right behind this we have added the menu in which we have got two variables the first one is a quick variable then we have got the fourth variable now what we will do is that we are going to write an mb.menu.add check button and as you can see that if you click on anyone you can see that it has been checked the reason behind this is that we are making making these variables a check button. So we are writing in mb.menu.add check button. So we are adding check buttons to the menu of the mb which is the menu button we have specified right at the top here. And we are using the variable quick variable to store this label cricket. And since this is a check variable as you can see that now both has been checked. And this is how basically you are going to create your menu buttons if you want to create it right over here you can also do that as well for that what you will do is that you have to specify menu over here and then you have to add it uh, downwards so i hope that you have understood how it is working you can see that you have got your menu button in which you have got two menu items if you want to add more menu items what you can do is that you can simply create variables right over here and you can just add them the very same way we have added them right over here. We have created a menu. You can add as many items as you want to add. So I hope that you have understood how this is functioning. So that is it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tikinter module in Python. In this tutorial, we are going to talk about the Tikinter menu. Now in the previous tutorial, when you were creating the menu button, you we have talked something about the menu. We have created a menu and we have added it or you can say attached it to the menu button. In this tutorial, we are going to talk in detail about menu. Now the goal of this widget is basically to allow us to create all kind of menus that can be used by our application. The core functionality provide ways to create three menu tops. The first one is the pop-up, then we have got the top level and then we have got the pull down menu. It is also possible to use other extended widgets to implement new type of menus such as the option menu widget which implements a 
special type that generates a pop-up list of items within a selection. So if you talk about the syntax, it is we have already discussed that. So I don't think that we have to discuss it anymore. Let's just discuss the options that are associated with it. The first one is the active background. That is the background color that will appear on the choice when it is under the mouse. Then we have got the active border width that specifies the width of the border drawn around the choice when it is under the mouse. The default is one pixel for it. Then we have got the active foreground that is the foreground color that will appear on a choice when it is under the mouse then we have got bg that is the background color for our choices not under the mouse then we have got pd that is the width of the border around all the choices and the default value for that is one then we have got cursor that is the cursor choice then we have got the disabled foreground that is the color of this text for items whose state is disabled then we have got font the default font for textual choices then we have got FG that is the foreground color. Then we have got a new one here that is the post command. Now you can set this option to a procedure and that procedure is going to get called every time someone brings up this menu. Then we have got relief that is the default 3D effect for menus and the default value for that is relief equal to raised. Then we have got the image that is to display an image on the menu button. Then we have got select color that is to select colors. Then we have got tear off which you have uh, discussed in the previous tutorial as well where we use tear off equal to zero. So normally a menu can be torn off. The first position that is the position zero in the list of choices is occupied by the tear off element and the additional choices are added started at position number one. So if you set tear off equal to zero the menu will not have a tear off feature and choices will be added starting at position zero. Now in the previous tutorial, if you remember, we set the tier off to zero when we were creating the menu and we were about to add it to the menu button. So there, when we added cricket, which was the first item that was added to the menu. So that cricket was going to be at position number zero because we set the tier off equal to zero. If you do not set the tier off equal to zero, then the tier off is going to occupy position number zero. And that cricket, which we added was going to be at position number one, but since we specify tier off equal to zero. So that's why tier off is not going to bother us. And cricket is going to appear at position number zero and football at position number one. So in simple words, if you have tier off equal to zero, you specify it, then elements which you add are going to start at position number zero. If you do not specify that, then tier off is going to take position number zero and every element you add is going to start on from position number one and so on. So I hope that you have understood the concept of tier off. Then the final one is title. Now, normally the title of a tier off menu window will be the same as the text of the menu button or the cascade that leads to this menu. Now, if you want to change the title of the window, you can just simply set the option, set this option to that string and you will have that title. Now there are certain methods associated with this menu widget as well. The first one is the add command that has one option as a parameter that is to add a menu item to the menu then we have got the add radio button that is to create a radio button menu item that is then we have got the add check button which we have used in the previous tutorial as well that is to create a check button menu item then we have got add cascade that is to create a new hierarchical menu by associating a given menu to a parent menu. Then we have got the add separator that is to add a separator line to the menu. Then we have got add that except two parameters, the type and the options. That is to add a specific type of item to the menu. Then some other methods include the delete that has got two parameters, the start and add, that deletes the menu items ranging from the start to the end. Then we have got the entry config that has again two parameters, the index and option that allows you to modify a menu items which is identified by the index and change its option. Then we have got index that has got one parameter as item that returns the index number of the given menu item label. Then we have got the insert separator that inserts a new separator at the position that is specified by the index which is a parameter to this function. Then we have got invoke. That has also one parameter as index that calls 
The command callback associated with the choice at position index. If a check button, its state is going to be toggled between set and clear. If a radio button, that choice is going to be set. And finally, we have got type that has one parameter index that returns the type of the choice specified by the index that can be either a cascade, check button, command, radio button, a separator or a tear off. So let's just see a brief example for how menus are going to be used in Tkinter GUI. We've already covered how menus are used, but this time we are going to discuss that in detail. So we have already got our main window where we have imported Tkinter. We have got our root window for which we have set our geometry as well. So what we will do is that we are going to create a menu bar that is going to be menu bar and this one is going to equal to the menu uh, widget that is going to be added to the root window. Alright, the next thing we are going to do is that we are going to create the menus. So we are going to basically create uh, three menus. So the first one is going to be a file menu, then we are going to have an edit menu, then we are going to have a help menu. So starting off with the file menu, we are going to write in file menu equal to menu and that is going to get added to the menu bar that is going to be the main one where everything is going to be added so it is going to be not m u n e it is going to be m e n u that is going to be added to the menu bar and we are going to specify the tier off so whatever elements we are going to add are going to start on adding into the menu from position number zero then we are going to have certain commands added to the file menu. So we are going to write in file menu dot add command and the label for that is going to equal to new. So that is whenever you click on file, for example, in here in the PyCharm, we have got this file. If you click on it, you can see that you've got a lot of options. So add command is basically going to add these options which are listed Whenever you click on this file, you can see that when you click on edit, you have got certain options. When you click on view, you have got certain options. So that is what we are going to do over here. So for now, we don't want anything to be done. You have covered the parameter that was command that was whenever you click on this, something is going to get executed. But for now, what we want is we want the command to do nothing. So we are going to write and do nothing. So Let's just skip it for now. We don't have to specify it, I guess. So the label is going to be new. Let's just copy it from here. Paste it three to four times and it is going to be, let's say new. It is going to be, let's say open. Then we are going to, let's say have the save command. And finally, let's say we are going to have the close command. So you can have as many command as you want. Finally, what we are going to do is that we are going to use file menu dot add separator so that is going to be a separator that is going to get added after that what we are going to do is that we are going to have file menu dot add command and the label this time is going to equal to exit now after that what we are going to do is that we are going to associate every option we have specified over here with a hierarchical thing. Now what I want to tell you here is that basically we have created our main menu. That is this menu bar. And then we have got this file menu which we have added to the menu bar. So now what we want is that we want to create a hierarchical item where we want to add all these elements to this main parent menu. Like for example, you can see that you've got this menu, right over here, menu bar over here where you have got this file and under the file you have again got options. So that is something that is in a hierarchy. So for that we have to use the add cascade. So we are going to write in menu bar dot add cascade. And in the add cascade, the label we are going to specify of our own choice, that is going to be file. And under the file, we are going to have this new open, save, close and exit. But how it is going to recognize that you have to add all these. For that, we are going to 
tell it that you have to add all of these and how we are going to do that we are going to write in menu equal to file menu so when we write in file menu over here it is automatically going to re realize that whatever has been created using the file menu object we have to add it under this label file and that is going to be in the hierarchy of the main menu bar which we have added to the root window so i hope that you are you are understanding what is going on in the hierarchy system over here then what we are going to do after that is that we are going to create a new menu all right let's just make it right over here so that one menu is in a single line after that we are going to create our edit menu so in the edit menu we are going to write in edit menu equal to menu that is also going to get added to the menu bar and the tier off for that is also going to equal to zero and in the edit menu we are going to write in edit menu dot add command and the first one is going to have the label of undo after that we are going to add a separator here so we are going to write in edit menu dot add and we are going to add a separator over here and after that we are going to add more commands to the edit menu so we will just copy this from here and we are going to paste it not like this we have to make new lines and we have to paste it four times so in the edit menu you can see that the normal commands that includes are the undo copy paste type of things so we have already got undo so what we will do here is that we are going to write in cut we are going to have copy we are going to have paste we are going to have the delete button so these are the five buttons we are going to have the first one is going to be undo then we are going to have a separator and then we are going to have these four commands that are the cut copy paste and delete so let's just move a bit up so these are the items that are going to get added to the menu button after that you have also to add this the very same way so it is going to be menu bar dot add cascade and this time the cascade is going to be for the label and the label is going to be named as edit and how we are going to tell it that you are going to add these five items is using is by using this edit menu object right over here so for that we are going to write in menu equal to edit menu and this is how it is going to realize that yes this is these are the items i have to add under the edit menu the label is going to be added they are going to be associated with the parent menu bar which is being added which is at the root window already so finally we are going to create one more menu that is going to be named as help menu and that is going to equal to menu and that is going to get added to the menu bar and the tear off for that is also going to equal to zero then we are going to write in help menu help menu dot add command and the label is going to be let's say the help desk then we can just add more commands so for that we will just copy this from here and we will paste it twice so let's say we are going to have the help desk over here we are going to have the about information over here we are going to have the version info over here and let's say we are going to have one more where we are going to have help over here or you can just write in as the online help all right so finally we are going to write in help menu dot add cascade and this time the label is going to equal to help and we are now going to tell it that these are the items you have to add i guess we have specified one extra bracket over here we don't need that so we are going to write in menu equal to help menu and that is going to do your job so finally you are going to have 
root dot configure menu as the menu bar and that is going to do your job we already have got our root dot main loop which is where uh, down here so we don't all right so this is basically the menu concept what we have done here is that we have actually created a menu bar that is added to the root window then after that we have created a file menu using the menu widget which is being added to the menu bar where the tier of equal to zero which means that this new is going to be added at position number zero this is going to be added using the add command these are the five items that are going to be added to this file menu and they are going to appear in the hierarchy of the parent menu bar under the label file and they are going to be labeled as menu equal to file menu and this is how it is going to realize that whatever has been added as this dot add command using the file menu object it has to add it under the label file and moreover it is also to be in the hierarchy of the menu bar which is the main or you can say the parent menu bar similarly you have got the edit menu and the help menu so let's just run this code and let's just hope that we do not have any errors all right as you can see that you have got two bars over here if you click on this you can see that you have got the options you click on edit you have got the undo you have got the cut copy paste and delete you can see that for now nothing happens if you click on these because we have got nothing associated with we have not specified any kind of command but the help menu is not visible i guess we have some kind of problem with that we have got help menu we have added commands and yes this is the problem we have to write in menu bar dot add cascade and after that it is going to be label equal to help and menu equal to help menu and i hope that this is now going to show menu yes we have got the help menu as well where we have got the four options the help desk the about the version information and the online help so for now if you click on any of these you can see that nothing happens but what you have seen over here is that we have got this menu bar the which is having file we have got edit and we have got help and under the hierarchy we have got the under the file we have got the new open save close and exit we have undo cut copy paste and delete under the edit menu and help desk about version information and online help under the help menu so this is how basically things work with menus i hope that you have understood we have covered that in a very detailed example so i hope that is it with so i think that is it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the tkinter module in python and in this tutorial we are going to talk about the tkinter message widget now this widget provides a multi-line and the non-editable object that displays text and it automatically break lines and justify their contents. Now its functionality is very similar to the one provided by the label widget except that it can also automatically wrap the text maintaining a given width or aspect ratio. So if you talk about the syntax that is very similar we have got master and options in the master we have got to represent the parent window and in the options we have got anchor that is to control where the text is going to be positioned if the widget has more space than the text need the default for that is center which centers the text in the available space of the message bar then we have got the bg that is for the normal background color then we have got bitmap that is equal to a bitmap or image object and the label will display that graphics then we have got the border width then after that we have got cursor that is the cursor shape that is going to appear when you are over the message box then you have got the font that is if you are displaying text in the label then you can just use this and you can specify the text you want to use then we have got the foreground color and the height that are going to display the foreground color and height for you then after that you have got the image that is if you want to display any kind of image then we have got justify that is to justify your text in the message bar then we have got the pad x and pad y for the padding towards the x and y coordinates 
of the message bar then we have got relief that is by default flat and that is to just decorate things for you and we have got the text variable then we have got the text variable variable and these both have the very same job as they were performing in the previous cases then we have got underline that is if you want to underline the text in the message bar then we have got the width of the message bar or the message you want to type in in characters not in pixels and finally we have got trap line that is if you want to limit the number of character in each line by setting this option to a desired number default value is zero means that lines will be broken only at new lines so we don't have any kind of associated function with it so let's just talk about the example part so this is our compiler where we are going to create our first message bar and that is a very simple job to do all you have to do is that you are going to write in a variable that is going to be a string variable that is going to actually store or hold your message because your message can have numbers it can have special characters it can have characters as well so that's why you need this string var class so that it can store every kind of message type you specify either it be numbers text or anything so what we will do is that we are going to write in a label equal to a message that is going to get added to the root window where the text variable is going to equal to the variable and we can just write in the relief if you want to specify and let's say it is raised now the default value for this is flat here but we have specified it to be raised then you can just write in var dot set and in here you can just write in the message you want to type in you can just write in this is a tkinter message widget tutorial simple enough and simply you can just write in label dot back and just run this code and that is going to do your job and as you can see that you have got this message bar kind of thing where you can have where you have got this message that is this is a taken from message widget tutorial so i hope that you have understood it it is very simple you have to just use the message widget class add it to the root window the text variable is going to be var that is going to store this message since we have specified var so you can just write in var.set and that is going to help you store your message and finally you have got label.pack and that is going to specify the geometry and that is going to be it so i hope that you have understood how to do it so i guess that is it with this tutorial as well thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the tkinter module in python and in this tutorial we are going to talk about the tkinter radio button now this widget implement a multi-choice button which is a way to offer many possible selection to the user and let user choose only one of them in order to implement this functionality each group of radio buttons must be associated to the same variable and each one of the buttons must symbolize a single value you can use the tap key to switch from one radio button to another radio button as well the syntax is the very same so let's just talk about the options the first one is the active background color that represents the background color when the mouse is over the radio button then we have got the foreground active color that is the foreground color when the mouse is over the radio button in the anchor if the widget inhabits a space larger than it needs this option specify where the radio button will sit in that space the default value for that is center then we have got the normal background color behind the indicator and label we have got to display a monochrome image on the radio button set this option to a bitmap then we have got the border width then we have got command that is a procedure that is going to get called we have got cursor that has the very same functionality that is if you set this option to a cursor name that can be an arrow or a dot the mouse cursor will change to that pattern when it is over the radio button then some other options include the font that is the font that is going to be used for the text we have got fg that is the color used to render the text then we have got height that is the number of lines of text on the radio button 
then we have got the highlight background that is the color of the focus highlight when the radio button does not have a focus then we have highlight color that is the color of the focus highlight when the radio button has the focus then we have got image that is to display a graphic image instead of text for this radio button you have to set this option to an image object then we have got justify that is if the text contain multiple line this option control how the text is going to be justified center is the default value you can set it to left or right as well then we have got the paddings that includes the pad x and pad y then we have got the relief then we have got the select color in the select color you have to choose the color of the radio button when it is set the default value for that is going to be red then we have got select image now if you are using the image option to display a graphic instead of text when the radio button is clear you can set the select image option to a different image that will display it when the radio button is set then you can just have the state the default is normal but you can set this to disable to gray out the control and make it unresponsive if the cursor is currently over the radio button the state is going to be active then we have got text that is the label that is going to be displayed next to a radio button then we have got some other options that include the text variable we have got underline we have got value and if you talk about value when a radio button is turned on by the user its control variable is going to be set to its current value option now if the current variable is an int var give each radio button in the group a different integer value option if the control variable is a string var give each radio button a different string value option then we have got the text variable to slave the text displayed in a label widget to a control variable of class string var set this option to that variable and we have got variable now the control variable that this radio button shares with the other radio buttons in the group this can be either an int var or a string var then we have got width the width of the label in characters if this option is not set the label will be sized to fit its content and finally we have got the wrap length you can limit the number of characters in each line by setting this option to a desired number default value is zero means that lines will be broken only at new lines then we have got certain methods which are associated with this radio button as well the first one is deselect that clears or you can say turn off the radio button then we have got flash that flashes the radio button a few times between its active and normal colors but leave it the way it started then we have got invoke you can call this method to get the same action that would occur if the user clicked on the radio button to change its state and finally we have got select that is to set or you can say turn on the radio button so let's just see an example for how radio button is going to be implemented in your compiler so right here we are going to create a first radio button for which we are going to use the var equal to int var all right so we are going to write an r1 equal to radio button added to the root window the text for that is going to equal to option number one and the variable is going to equal to var and we are going to specify we don't need anything else but now we are going to just just write an r1 dot back and we are going to specify an anchor for this that is going to be w then we are going to just copy this from here paste it over here paste it again and this time it is going to be r2 equal to radio button it is going to be option number two the variable is going to remain the very same and the this time it is going to be r2 dot pack then we have got r3 and r3 dot pack and it is going to be option number three so what you can do now is that you can just go on and run this code as you can see that you've got three options and you can see that you have got selection of all of these three so what you will do for that is that you are going to have a label here
that is going to equal to label that is going to be added to the root window and we are going to write in label dot pack now what we will do is that we are going to associate functions not the functions we are going to associate commands with it so we are going to write in here value equal to one and command equal to sel that is going to be a function that is going to be get called whenever we click on this radio button number one so just copy this from here paste it over here this time the value is going to be two and here it is going to be set to three now what we are going to do is that right at the top here we are going to define a function named as sel and in this function we are going to write in selection equal to you have selected and then we are going to concatenate it with var.get so it is going to get the value and it is going to display that and we are going to write in label.configure with the text that is equal to selection so if you now run this code and if you click on any of the option you can see that it displayed you have selected one if you click on two it is going to say you have selected two if you click on three it is going to say you have selected three so now it is basically a set of variables or you can say set of three radio buttons in which you can only select one if you want to create one more set what you can do is that you have to create one more variable over here let's say it is going to be variable number one and it is also going to be int var and after that what you can do is that you can just have radio buttons and you can just add it to this variable number one in place of this var over here and that is going to do your job simple enough now we have talked about some functions as well so let's just say we want to select something using that so let's say you want to select r2 so you're going to write an r2 dot select run this code and you can see that option number two has already been selected because of this function select because as i told you there about select that it is going to set or turn on the radio button then you also have got the deselect button so it is going to be deselect run this code and you can see that it is being deselected now so this is how basically the select and deselect work you can similarly use the invoke and flash function as well so i guess that is it with this tutorial we have created radio buttons i have told you how you can have another set of radio buttons where you will be allowed other choices as well so i guess that is it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tikinter module in Python and in this tutorial we are going to talk about Tikinter scale. Now the scale widget provides a graphical slider object that allows you to select values from a specific scale. If you talk about the syntax, it is the very same. We have got w equal to scale, master and options. So let's just talk about the options. The first one is the active background, that is the background color when the mouse is over the scale. And we have got bg. That is the background color of the parts of the widget that are outside the trough. Then we have got BD that is the width of the 3D border along or around the trough or and slider. The default value for that is going to remain the very same that is 2 pixels. Then we have got command that is a procedure to be called every time the slider is moved. This procedure will be passed one argument the new scale value. If the slider is moved rapidly you may not get a callback for every possible motion but you'll certainly get a callback when it settles then we have got cursor that is if you set this option to a cursor name the mouse cursor will changes change to that pattern when it is over the scale then we have got digits now the way your program reads the current value shown in a scale widget is through a control variable the control variable for a scale can be int var it can be a double var or a string var 
If it is a string v variable, the digits option control how many digits to use when the numeric scale value is converted to a string. Then we have got font that is the font used for the label and annotations. Then we have got fg that is the color of the text used for the labels and annotations. Then some other options include the form from and then we have got an underscore over here. That is a float or integer value that defines one end of the scales range. Then we have got the highlight background that is the color of the focus highlight when the scale does not have a focus. In the highlight color we define the color of the focus highlight when the scale has the focus. Then we have got label. Now you can display a label within the scale widget by setting this option to a label text. The label appears in the top left corner if the scale is horizontal or the top right corner if the scale is vertical. By default, we have got no label. Then we have got length, that is the length of the scales widget. This is basically the x dimension if the scale is horizontal or the y dimension if the scale is vertical. The default value for this is basically 100 pixels. Then we have got the orient that is by default horizontal. If you set orient equal to horizontal, if you want the scale to run along the x dimension or orient equal to vertical to run parallel to the y axis and as I told you the default is horizontal. Then we have got the relief. Now you have to specify the appearance of a decorative border around the label. The default is flat for other values. Now some other options include something new. The first one is the repeat delay. Now this option control how long button one has to be held down in the drop before the slider starts moving in that direction repeatedly. Default is repeat delay equal to 300 and the units are milliseconds for that. Then we have got resolution. Normally the user will only be able to change the scale in whole units. Set this option to some other value to change the smallest increment of the scale's value. For example, if from equal to minus 1.0 and to equal to 1.0 and you set resolution equal to 0.5, the scale will have five possible values that are going to be minus 1.0, minus 0 0.5, 0 0.0, 0 0.5 and 1.0. So that are they are all going to be according to the increment you have provided with resolution because the from value was one minus 1.0, the to value was 1.0 and the resolution was set to 0.5 so that's why it is going to start on from minus 1.0 it is going to have an increment of 0.5 that is going to make it equal to 0 minus 0.5 then 0.0 then 0.5 and finally 1.0 then we have got the show value and slider length in the show value normally the current value of the scale is displayed in text form by the slider above it for horizontal scales to the left for vertical scale you have to set this option to zero to suppress that label and in the slider label normally the slider is 30 pixels along the length of the scale. You can change that length by setting the slider length option to your desired length. Then we have got state. Now normally the scale widget responds to mouse events and when they have the focus also the keyboard events. You have to set state equal to disabled to make the widget unresponsive. Then we have got the take option, take focus option. Now normally the focus will cycle through scale widget. Set this option to zero if you don't want this behavior. Then we have got one more interesting one that is the tick interval. Now to display periodic scale options, you have to set this option to a number and ticks will be displayed on multiples of that value. For example, if the from value is 0.0, .0 and the to value is 1.0, and the tick interval is 0.25, labels will be displayed along the scale at values at 0.0, .0 then 0.25, then 0.50, then 0.75, and then 1.0. These labels appear below the scale if horizontal, to its left if vertical, default is 0 which suppresses the display of the ticks. So I hope that you have understood what tick interval is doing over here. That is to actually display tick intervals at the interval you want it to appear. For example, as I told you in the example that if you set the tick interval to 0 
the from value is 0 0.0 to value is 1.0 which means that you have got an interval from 0 0.0 to 1.0 and you have set the tick interval to 0 0.25 so you are going to have labels that are going to be displayed at 0 0.0 then 0 0.25 then 0 0.5 then 0 0.75 and finally 1.0 then we have got some other options which include the trough color that is the color of the trough then we have got the two option which is again a very interesting one now it is going to be a float or integer value that defines one end of the scales range. The other end is defined by the from options which we have discussed above. Now the two value can be either greater than or it can be less than the from value. For vertical scale the two value defines the bottom of the scale and for horizontal scale it defines the right side. Then we have got variable. Now the control variable for this scale if you have got any Control variables may be from class that can be int var, the double var or the string var. In the later case the numerical value will be converted to a string and finally we have got weight, the width of the top part of the widget. This is the x dimension for vertical scales and y dimension if the scale has orient equal to horizontal. The default is 15 pixels for the weight. Then we have got certain methods that are associated with the scale as well. The first one is get that is the method that returns the current value of the scale and then we have got set as well that sets the scales value. So let's just move on to the example part and let's just see how we are going to have our scale in the compiler. So here we are. So right here what we are going to do is that we are going to create a variable and as I told you that we can have any kind of class that can be int var, the double var or the string var. So here we are going to create a double var class. So now we are going to write in scale that is an object. With it we are going to define the scale widget class that is going to be added to the root window and the variable is going to equal to var that is a double v that is from a double var class finally we can just write in scale dot back and we are going to specify an anchor for that as well that is going to be center all right after that what we are going to do is that as i told you that we have got certain functions associated with it so for that we are going to create a button that is going to be added to the root window as well. The text on that button is going to be equal to get scale value. So that is going to get us the current scale value and the command that is going to get called when you click on that button is going to be SEL which we are going to define just in a moment. Finally we can just pack this button and we can just specify the anchor for that as well that is going to be center as well and we are also going to have a label that is basically going to display whatever is the value which is it which it has got from this thing right over here so since we need to display it so that's why we need to create a label for that and we have to write on label.pack as well all right now right above here we are going to define that function so we are going to write in sel and in this function what we are going to do is that we are going to write in selection equal to value and we are going to concatenate it with whatever variable we have got so whatever variable is going to be the this variable which is basically going to be the scale current position or the current value of the scale so it is going to be var dot get after that we can just write in label dot configure and we are going to write in text equal to selection not this it is going to be selection all right so let's just run this code Alright, as you can see that we have got this scale since we have not specified the starting or ending position like that. We have not specified any kind of additional things with, uh, with it as well since we have not specified the from value. We have not specified the end value as well. 
So that's why we have got a scale from zero. So if you start scrolling it, you can see that the value is changing. If you keep scrolling it, you can see that it is by default at 100. As I told you, that the default value for the two variable is 100. So it is going to be at 100 at max and zero at min. So if you at any instant, let's say you are at 60, 49, let's say, you just click on this gets a scale value, you can see that you have got value equal to 49.0. Now you can have, you can have anything, you can have, you can use any of the options which I have discussed in this tutorial before. And I strongly suggest you that you just go on and try every option to be very specific. You must go on and try the from, the to, the tick interval option and one more which was I guess the uh, resolution option. So I want you to go on and try all those options yourself and you are going to see how they are going to be used in this uh, slider or uh, this, this scale option which you have got right over here. So I hope that you have understood how to create a scale, how to get the current value, how these values for the scale are changing. So for this tutorial, I guess that is it. We have already covered an example. So thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tkinter module in Python and in this tutorial we are going to talk about the Tkinter scroll bar. Now this widget provides a slide controller that is used to implement vertically scrolled widgets such as a list box, text and canvas. Now you can also create horizontal scroll bars on entry widgets as well if you want to. So if you talk about this syntax it is the very same. All you have to change is you have to write in scroll bar, master and options remain the same. So let's just talk about the options that are associated with this widget where the first one is the active background color that is the color of the slider and arrow heads when the mouse is over them. Then we have got BG that is the color of the slider and arrow heads when the mouse is not over them. Then we have got BD. Now the width of the 3D borders around the entire parameter of the drop and also the width of the 3D effects on the arrow heads and slider. Default is no border around the drop and a 2 pixel border around the arrow heads and the slider. Then we have got command that is a procedure to be called whenever the scroll bar is moved. We have got cursor that is the cursor that is going to appear when the mouse is over the scroll bar. Then we have got element border width. Now the width of the borders around the arrow heads and sliders is going to be defined using this. The default is element border width equal to minus one which means to use the value of the border width option. Then we have got highlight background that is the color of the focus highlight when the scroll bar does not have a focus. Then we have got highlight color that is the color of the focus highlight when the scroll bar has the focus. Then we have got highlight thickness that is the thickness of the focus highlight default value is one. Set it to zero to suppress display of the focus highlight. Then we have got an option that is something very interesting that is jump. Now this option controls what happens when a user drags the slider. Normally jump equal to zero. Every small drag of the slider causes the command callback to be called. If you set this option to one, the callback is not called until the user releases the mouse button. Then we have got orient. Set orient equal to horizontal for a horizontal scroll bar and set orient equal to vertical for a vertical one. Then we've got the repeat delay option over here. This option control how long button one has to be held down in the drop before the slider starts moving in that direction repeatedly. Default is a repeat delay equal to 300 and the units for that are milliseconds. Then we've got the repeat interval. That is the repeat interval. Then we've got the take focus. Normally you can tab the focus through a scroll bar widget. Set take focus equal to zero if you don't want this behavior. Then you have got the trough color that is the color of the trough and finally we have got the width that is the width of the scroll bar. It's y dimension if horizontal and it's x dimension if vertical. Default value for width here is 16. Then we have got certain methods associated with the scroll bar widget as well. The first one is the get. Now it returns two number describing the current position of the slider. The numbers, let's say it may be X and Y. So the X value gives the position of the left or top edge of the slider for horizontal and vertical scroll bars respectively. Whereas the Y value gives the position of the right 
or the bottom edge. Then we have got set which has two parameters, the first and the last. Now to connect a scroll bar to another widget, let's say W, you have to set the W's X scroll command or the Y scroll command to the scroll bar set method. The argument have the same meaning as the values that are going to be returned by the get method. So let's just see an example for how we are going to have scroll bars in our compiler. So what we are going to do is that we are going to have a simple scroll bar for that we are going to define an object named as scroll bar and we are going to make it equal to the class that is going to create scroll bar for us and we are going to add it to the root window. Then we are going to write in scroll bar dot back. The site for that is going to be right site. And we are going to write in fill equal to y. After that what we are going to do is that we are going to define a list here. It is going to be a list box. We are going to add it to the root window. We are going to set the y scroll command to scroll bar dot set. And what we are going to do after that is we are going to write in for a line in range of 100 we are going to write in my list dot insert till the end this is line number and we are going to concatenate it with a string named as line so after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write in my list dot back and we are going to pack it to the side left and fill is going to equal to both and finally we are going to write in scroll bar dot config and the command is going to equal to my list dot view and that is going to do your job so let's just run it and see what it is doing and then I'm going to explain it again so right here it is going to be a capital Y yes that solves the problem let's just run this code all right I guess we've got some issue all right it says list box has got no attribute named as view all right where is my list dot all right it has to be Y view not only view and yes I guess that is going to solve the problem let's just run it again and yes we you can see that we have got this thing we have got it hundred times right here you can see that you've got it from 0 till 99 so that makes it a hundred times and you can see that you've got this uh, scroll bar which you can just scroll up and down so to give you what is going on over here is actually as you can see right here that the first thing we have done is that we have simply created a scroll bar now as I told you that scroll bar is something which you have to associate it associate with something like you can just associate it with a list box you can just associate it with an entry widget you can associate it with other things as well so right here what we have done is that we have associated a scroll bar with a list box so we have created a simple list box after that we have specified the pack for that we have specified the geometry management for that where the side is right and the fill is y as you can see if you run this code again you can see that you have got the scroll bar at the right side where you have got the fill at the y coordinate as well after that what you have done is that you have created a variable named as my list and using that you have created a list box and as I told you about the set option which we have used over here is that if you want to connect a scroll bar to another widget which is a list box in this case then in here you have to set the list box y scroll command to the scroll bar set method the arguments have the same meaning as the values that are going to be returned by the get method so here what you are going to do is that you're going to set the y scroll command of the scroll bar and you are going to use the set method with it so you are going to set the scroll bar to the y scroll command of the list box 
after that what you're going to do is that you are going to add elements into this my list or the list box you have created so you are you are going to do it in a very simple way you're going to just create a for loop from 0 to 100 and you're going to just insert elements into it until the end and it is going to be very simple message that is going to say this is line number and you're going to write in string dot line all right so this line basically represents the line number so after that what you're going to do is that you're going to simply pack to the left side after that you're going to configure the scroll bar and the command through with which you are going to actually do it is that you're going to write in my list that is the list box the object through which the list box is created and you're going to write in dot y view and you're writing in y view over here because you have used y scroll command over here after that you have got the root dot main loop and as you can see if that you've run this code it is working completely fine you have got the list box towards the left side you have got the scroll bar towards the right side and it is configured perfectly with the list box as you can see that if you move the scroll bar the list box also moves up and down so this is how basically you can create scroll bars and you can associate it with other widgets as well so i hope that you have understood how to create and associate it associate scroll bars with other widgets so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys later hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the tkinter module in python and in this tutorial we are going to talk about the tkinter text widget so text widget provide advanced capabilities that allows you to edit a multi-line text and you can format it the way it has to be displayed such as like changing its color or you can change its fonts as well so you can also use elegant structures like tabs and marks to locate specific sections of the text and apply changes to those areas moreover you can embed windows and images in the text because this widget was designed to handle both plain and formatted text so if you talk about the syntax of the text widget it is very simple you have to write in w equal to text then you have got the master that represents the parent window as usual and then you have got a set of options now to talk about the options we have got bg that is the default background color then we have got the border width then we have got the cursor then we have got the export selection now normally the text selected within a text widget is exported to be the selection in the window manager so if you set the export selection equal to zero it means that you don't want that behavior the next one is the font that is the default font for text inserted into the widget then we have got the fg that is the color used for text and bitmaps within the widget you can change the color for tagged regions this option is uh, just the default then we have got height that is the height of the widget in lines not in pixel measured according to the current font size then we have got the highlight background that is the color of the focus highlight when the text widget has the focus to talk about some more options we have got uh, the highlight color that is the color of the focus highlight when the text widget has got the focus then we have got the highlight thickness that is the thickness of the focus highlight default value is one if you set highlight thickness equal to zero you you do it to suppress the display of the focus highlight then we have got the insert background that is the color of the insertion cursor where the default color is black then we have got the insert border width that is the size of the 3d border around the insertion cursor and the default value for insert border width is zero then we have got the insert off time that is the number of millisecond the insertion cursor is off because it's a because of during its blink cycle so if you set this option to zero you do it to suppress the blinking and the default value for the insert off time is 300 then we have got the insert on time and the number of milliseconds the insertion insertion cursor is on during its blink cycle that is known as the insert on time and the default value for insert on time is 600 then we have got the insert width that is the width of the insertion cursor and basically its height is determined by the tallest item in its line and the default value for that is two pixels then we have got the pad x and pad y pad x determine the size of the internal padding added to the left and right of the text area and pad y determines the size of the internal padding above and below the text area 
and for both of them the default value is one pixel then we have got relief that is the 3d appearance of the text widget and default value for that is sunken then we have got the select background that is the background color to use while displaying the selected text then we have got the select border width that is the width of the border to use around the selected text then we have got spacing 1 spacing 2 and spacing 3 in spacing 1 this option specifies how much extra vertical space is put above each line of a text if a line wraps this space is added only because the first line it occupies on the display and the default value for spacing 1 is 0. Secondly if you talk about the spacing number 2 this option specify how much extra vertical space to add between displayed lines of text when a logical line wraps and the default value for that is also 0. Then if you talk about the spacing 3 this option specifies how much extra vertical space is added below each line of a text. If a line wraps, this space is added only after the last line it occupies on the display. And the default value for spacing 3 is also 0. Then we have got state. So normally text widget basically respond to keyboard and mouse event. So if you set the state to normal, you, have, you, you get this behavior. If you set state equal to disabled, the text widget will not respond and you won't be able to modify its content programmatically either. Then we have got tabs. This option basically control how tab characteristics is going to position your text. Then we have got width that is the width of the character of the widget in characters not in pixels as usual. Then if you talk about more options we have got wrap and wrap basically controls the display of the lines that are too wide. Set wrap equal to word and it will break the line after the last word that will fit. With the default behavior wrap equal to char any line that gets too long will be broken at any character. Then finally we have got the x scroll command and the voice scroll command. If we talk about the x scroll command that is to make the text widget horizontally scrollable. So set this option to the set method of the horizontal scroll bar and similarly if you talk about the voice scroll command that is to make the text widget scroll vertically and you have to set this option to the set method to scroll the scroll bar vertically. Then we have got certain methods that are associated with this text widget. The first one is the delete which takes in two arguments start and end. This method basically deletes a specific character or a range of text which you have to specify as parameters to this function. Then we have got the get method that also takes in two parameters that is the start index and the end index. And this method basically return a specific character or a range of text which you have to specify and pass as parameter to this function. Then we have got the index that takes in one parameter index that returns the absolute value of an index based on the given index. Then we have got the insert method that takes in two arguments. The first one is the index where you have to put your string and the second one is the string which you want to insert at a specific index that is the first argument. So to conclude this method insert string at the specified index location. Then we have got the C method that takes in one parameter index and this method basically returns true if the text located at the index position is visible. Now text widgets basically support uh, some distinct helper structures that are the marks and tabs. So if you talk about the marks there are certain things which you have to know. Basically marks are used to bookmark positions between two characters within a given text. We have got some methods that are available for handling marks. The first one is index that takes in one parameter mark that basically returns the line and column location of a specific mark which you have specified. Then we have got the mark gravity that takes in two parameters the mark and gravity that returns the gravity of the given mark. So if the second argument is provided the gravity is set for the given mark. Then we have got mark names that basically return all marks from the text widget which you have set already. And this is then the method that is used to set the marks that takes into parameter mark and index that informs a new position to the given mark. And finally we have got the mark unset that basically removes the given mark from the text widget. Then as I told you that we have also got tags and basically tags are used to associate names to regions of text which makes easy the task of modifying the display settings of specific text areas. Tags are also used to bind event callbacks 
to specific ranges of text. And similarly, we have also got certain methods that are available for handling tabs. So the first one is the tag add method that takes in, I guess, three parameters. The first one is the tag name. Then we have got the start index and then we have got the end index. So this method tags either the position that is defined by the start index or a range delimited by the positions start index and end index. Then after that, we have got the tag config and you can use this method to configure the tag properties which include justify, then it includes tabs and then it includes the underline. So in the justify, you can either the center justify, left justify or right justify things. Then in the tabs, this property has the same functionality as of the text widget tabs property. And in the underline, you can just use it to underline the tagged text. Then we have got the tag delete that takes in one parameter tag name. This method is basically as simple as it look, used to delete and remove a given tag, which is given as a parameter to this tag delete function. Then we have got this tag remove function that takes in three parameters. The first one is the tag name. Then we have got the start index and the end index. So after applying this method, the given tag is going to be removed from the provided area without deleting the actual tag definition. And that is exactly what is the difference between tag delete and tag remove. Tag delete actually removes everything. It removes the given tag, but the tag remove is going to only remove the tag from the provided area, but it is not going to delete the actual tag definition. So I hope that you have understood the difference between the tag delete and tag remove. So these are basically the methods that are associated with tags and are used to handle tags. So let's just move on to the example part and see what we have got in the compiler. So right here, what we are going to do is that we are going to have a, we already have got this. So we are going to create a text. So you can use any of the variable which we have specified there. You can use that. So for now, we are going to make it as simple as it. We are going to just create a text widget. It is going to get added to the root window. After that, we are going to use the insert method and we are going to insert elements into this uh, text area or text widget we have created. So for that, we are going to specify a tag and that is going to be insert. And here we are going to specify the text we want to add in. So let's say I just want to say hello world. So this is the tag I want to add and let's say I want to insert something more. So right here, I'm going to specify this as end. And here I'm going to specify goodbye. And finally, I'm going to write in text dot back and that is going to do my job. So if I just run this code, All right, I guess we just missed the brackets. Yes, we have, I guess so. Let's just stop this. Specify the brackets and now run it. And as you can see that you have got a text widget that says hello world. And finally, it also says goodbye at the very end. So let's just add a space here so that it is much more clear. All right, so now what we are going to do, what we have done so far is that we have created, how, we have seen how to create a text widget and how to use the methods that are associated with it. As you can see that we have used the insert method. So now what we are going to do is that we are going to, let's say, use the tags. So we are going to write in text equal to tag add. And what we are going to do is that we are going to specify three parameters. The first one is going to be the tag name. Then we are going to specify the start index and then we are going to specify the end index. So we are going to name it as let's say tag and we are going to add it at let's say 1.0 and we, the end index is going to equal to 1.5. All right. So Let's just configure this tag. So we are going to write in text dot tag config. And in the configuration, we are going to first specify the tag we want to configure. So that is going to be the tag. 
And right here, what we are going to do is that we are going to specify the things which we want to configure for this tag. So let's say I want to just change the background color for that. So I'm going to write in background equal to, let's say I want the background to be white. Or let's just make it to black. And the foreground is going to be white. All right, so this is what is going, it, I have to specify it in these parentheses as well. Not the parentheses, the quotation marks. And now let's just run it and see what happens. All right, as you can see here that at the 1.0 till 1.5, what we have got here is that we have got a tag. And as you can see that since we have configured this tag, so we can clearly see that tag as well. We can see that we have got the background as black and then we have also got the foreground as white for the tag which we have added. So this is how basically you can add a tag and this is how basically you can configure that as well. So you can add any, any number of tags. For example, I want to add one more tag here. So I'm going to write in text dot tag add and I'm going to name it as tag one. And let's say I want to make it from, let's say 1.6 or let's say 1.7 and I have to make this also in the quotation marks and it is going to be till 1.12 I guess. And let's just configure that as well. So right here we are going to write in text.config and in the configuration, we are going to specify the name of the tag we want to configure. And we will just copy this from here. Paste it over here. And let's just run our code. And as you can see over here that we have got it from one point, it should have been 1.6 so that it would have been somewhere here. So let's just make it to 1.6 till 1.11. And I guess that is going to cover the world completely. Now, as you can see that we have got two tags. So this has been as specified as tag. And this one has been specified as tag one, which we have configured right here, as you have seen. So this is how basically you can use tags as well. So I hope that you have understood how to use the text widget. So I guess for this tutorial, that is it as well. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tkinter module in Python. And in this tutorial, we are going to talk about the Tkinter top level widget. Now the top level widget work as windows that are directly managed by the window manager. They do not necessarily have a parent widget on the top of them. So your application can use any number of top level windows. The number is not specified. It's your own choice. It depends on the application or you can say the work that you are doing that you can use any number of top level windows. The number of windows you require, you can just go on and create them. So if you talk about the syntax of top level, it is as W equal to top level, then you have got options here. So in the options, you have got BG that is the background color of the window you have got the border width you have got cursor you have got class underscore now normally the text selected within a text widget is exported to be the selection in the window manager so if you set the class equal to zero that is if you don't want that behavior then you have got font that is the default font for text inserted into the widget you have got the foreground color then in some other options, we have got the height, that is the window height, then we have got relief. Normally a top level window will have a 3D border around it. To get a shaded border, you have to set the BD option larger than its default value of zero and set the relief option to one of the constants. And finally, we have got width, that is the desired width of the window. So these are the limited options you have got with the top level widget. Then we have got some methods. The first one is the deoc the iconify with uh, method now it displays the window after using either the iconify or the withdraw methods then we have got frame that returns a system specific window identifier then we have got group that takes in one parameter window as well and it adds the window to the window group that is administered by the given window 
Then finally we have got the Iconify that turns the window into an icon without destroying it. Then we have got Protocol that takes in two parameters name and function and it basically registers a function as a callback which will be called for the given protocol. Then we have got the state method that returns the current state of the window. Now the possible values for this method what it will return are normal, iconic, withdrawn and icon. Then we have got the transient that takes in one parameter master and it turns the window into a temporary transient window for the given master or to the windows parent when no argument is given to this function. Then in some other methods we have got the withdraw method that removes the window from the screen without destroying that window. Then we have got the max size and the min size that both takes two parameters that are the width and the height. Now the max size defines the maximum size for the window in width and height whatever you specify and same goes for the min size that defines the minimum size for the window. Then we have got the position from method that takes in one parameter who and it basically defines the position controller. Then we have got the resizable option that takes into parameter width and height and it defines the resize flag which control whether the window can be resized or not. Then we have got the size from that takes in one parameter who that defines the size controller similar to the position uh, controller uh, above. And finally we have got the title function that takes in one parameter string and it defines the window title. So let's just move on to the example part and see how a top level widget is going to be created in our compiler. So here we are. So here you can see that we already have got one of our window that is the root equal to tk and it will create a window for us. Now using the top level we are going to create one more window. So we are going to write in top equal to top level and we are going to write in top dot main loop. All right. So let's just run this code and see what happens. And here we go. And as you can see that we have got two windows. Now one of these windows is basically the window that has been created using this command that is root equal to tk. And the other window is the one that has been created using this command that where we write the top equal to top level. So I hope that you have understood how to create them. Now you can use any of the methods which you have learned here. So for example, I want to let's say specify this title function. So how am I going to use it is that uh, right here I'm going to write in top dot title and I'm going to give this window a title. Let's say I'm going to give it as a top level window. So let's just run this code. And as you can see that again we have got two windows and one of these windows as you can see here if you just scroll it a bit to the right you can see that one of these has the title as top level window. So this means that this is actually the top level window and this is the root equal to tk window which has been created using this command. And the window that has been created using the top level is basically this window as we have specified the title for that that distinguishes it from the normal window. So this is how basically you can use any of the functions which we have used. You can specify the maximum size, the minimum size, the position controller, the size controller, resizing things, iconify frame group, iconify protocol state and transient. So you can use any of these option with this widget. So I hope that you have understood how a top level window is created and you can have as many top level windows as you want. There is no restriction on the number of top level windows you can create in a single application. So I guess that is it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tkinter module in Python. So basically what we have done so far is that we have covered every widget that is possible in Tkinter. We have studied its uses. We have covered every widget and every kind of thing that is related with it. So in this tutorial we are going to make an application and I'm going to make a very simple application to just try and wrap how to make an application using the widgets we have studied so far. 
So in this tutorial, basically we are going to be creating a calculator application and that is going to be a very simple calculator that is going to perform the very basic operation that a calculator do that are the addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. So we are not going into the complex calculator. We are going to keep it simple and we are going to create a calculator application in Tikinter Python. So without wasting any more time, let's just move on to the compiler. And right here we have the very same directory in which we'll, we will be working. So the first thing we need to do over here is that we need to write in from tkinter import hysteric. So this is going to import the tkinter for us. Now the first thing we are going to do over here is that we are going to create our driver code. Now in the driver code what we are going to do is that we are going to create our GUI window. We are going to set the configurations and the title and the geometry for our main GUI window. Then what we are going to do is that we are also going to talk about the expression field as well as the buttons that are going to be a part of this calculator because uh, this calculator is going to be a whole lot of kind of a button type of things in which we will have buttons from 0 to 9 then we will have buttons for plus minus subtraction not subtraction multiplication and division then we will have an equal to button as well so all these buttons as well as the main GUI window is going to be a part of the driver code so in this tutorial we are going to have start from there and then we are going to move towards the functions part where we are going to code the functions so the first thing we are going to do is that we are going to just organize our code so how we are going to organize our code so that it runs in a manner we want it to so for that we are going to create our driver over here that is going to be if name equal equal to main so this is going to help us to regulate our code and you know that if you write in this thing over here you know that everything inside this is going to be executed first so right here we are going to create our main GUI window that is going to equal to root equal to TK and that is going to create the GUI window for us you know that now what we are going to do is that we are going to configure it and we are going to specify the background color for this so let's just write in background and background is going to equal to let's say let's just make it to let's say white or just make it gray all right so we have configured our root window now what we are going to do is that we are also going to set the title for our root window so the title is going to be calculator application and what we are going to do next is that we are also going to set the geometry for this so we are going to write in root dot geometry and the geometry is going to be 270 by 150 so this configure our root window now as you know that in a calculator the most important thing is the expression field or you can say the equation in which we write the term which you want to evaluate for example if you want to let's say just add two numbers let's say you want to write in 2 plus 2 then that is basically called as an equation and you need to store it in an expression field so for that what we are going to do is that we are going to create an equation and we are going to make it equal to string variable now string variable is basically the variable class and what we have done over here is that we have created an instance of the string variable class now the reason behind creating the variable of a string variable class is that since the expression which we want to evaluate is going to have the plus sign it is going to have the minus signs it is going to have numbers like two three four or anything else so that's why we need something that is that can store both integers as well as the special characters that includes the plus minus multiply and divide signs so that's why we need to have an expression that is going to store everything that is the string variable class and that's why we have created an instance of the string variable class now what we need to do is that we have only created an instance of the string variable class now we need to use it 
for the expression field where we are going to write our expression that can be anything like 2 plus 2. So we are going to create a variable named as expression field and that is going to equal to an entry because that is where you want to write in something and we are going to add it, it to, the, to, to the root window and the text variable for that text variable for that is going to equal to the equation which you have used right over here which is basically an instance of the string variable class so what we are doing over here actually is that we have created an instance of the string variable class and we have written the expression field which is going to be an entry field with where you you will be required or you will be asked to just write in something so you've added it to the root window and the text variable for that is going to be an equation which means that you can just write in numbers and you can also write in the special characters like plus minus multiply or divide now what we need to do is that we need to use the grid method to for placing so the widget are at respective position in table like structures so what we will do is that we are going to write in expression field dot grid and the column span for that is going to equal to 4 and we are going to provide the iPad X and the iPad X for that is going to equal to 70. So that is going to place the expression field at a specific location that is going to be at the top of the calculator and finally what you are going to do also is that you are going to write in equation dot set enter your expression so when you have not written any kind of expression at the entry field which you have created right over here it is going to have this term that's that is going to say enter your expression and since you as you can see that i have set it using the equation that is basically an instance of the string variable class so it can also have the characters because string variable class is going to have numbers it is going to have special characters as well as it is going to have these strings or you can say the characters which we have written right over here so it is kind of a dynamic thing so you need don't need to worry about that now what we need to do is that we need to create buttons at a particular location inside the root window so when the user press the button a command or function affiliated to that button is going to get executed so the buttons that can be a part of calculator are going to be the buttons from one to nine then we can also have the button for zero then we can also have the button for the plus sign the minus sign the multiply sign the divide sign as well as we are going to have a button for the equal to sign on which we when we click when we click on it the expression or equation which you have written gets evaluated and the answer for that is generated also we are going to have a clear button and we are also going to have a decimal button as well so this is these are the buttons that are going to be a part of our calculator so let's just start writing the buttons so the first button is going to be button one we are also going to specify the grid but we are going to specify that later first we are going to create that button so we are going to write in button we are going to add it to the root window the text on the button is going to equal to one and the foreground color for the button is going to equal to black and the background color for the button is going to equal to white oh well, let's just swap it let's just make the foreground color to be white and the background color to be black all right that seems good enough and then what we are going to do also is that we are going to associate a command with this button so whenever this button is click a certain command is going to get executed so the command is going to be a lambda function that is going to be press one dot press one is going to be the function that is going to get called but for now we have got a red line because we have not created this function and we are also going to specify the height for the button and we are going to specify the width for the button as well that is going to be seven all right now we are also going to specify the grid for button number one so we are going to write in button one dot grid and the row for that is going to be equal to two because row number one has been occupied by the entry field and the column for that is going to equal to zero 
so what you need to do now is that to create the button number two you will just copy this from here because we don't want to waste our time creating buttons so this one is going to be button number two this one is going to be button number two dot grid the text on the button is going to be two and this one is going to be two as well and we are also going to specify the grid that is going to get changed the row is going to be the very same because one and two are going to be in the same row but the column is going to be changed similarly just paste it again this is going to be button number three button number three dot grid the row is going to remain the very same but the column is going to be two this time the text is going to be three and the press is also going to pass in three to the press function then we have got button number four that is going to have button number four dot grid and in the button number four dot grid the row is also going to now change and the column is going to remain at zero then it is going to have four over here and we are going to pass in four to the press function as well then we are going to have button number five button number five dot grid then we are going to have the text as five pass in five and we are going to have row is going to remain the very same not the same it is going to be three and the column is going to be one for button number five it is going to be three one all right good enough the next one is going to be button number six button number six dot grid the row is going to be three and the column is going to be two and the text for that is going to equal to six and it is going to be six as well then it is going to be button number seven button number seven dot grid the text on that is going to equal to seven and the value that is going to be passed is going to be seven as well and for the button number seven the row is going to equal to four the column is going to remain at zero then we are going to have button number eight this is going to be button number eight dot grid row is going to be four and the column is going to be one and it is going to have eight it is going to pass in eight as well and finally we are going to have button number nine and it is going to be button number nine dot grid the text on that is going to equal to nine it is going to pass in nine the row is going to be four and the column for that is going to equal to two so that concludes the button from one to nine we can also have button number zero so let's just create that as well so it is going to be button number zero button number zero dot grid and the text on that is going to equal to zero and the value that it is going to pass is also going to equal to zero and the column for that is going to equal to five the row is going to equal to five and the column is going to equal to zero and the rest for that button number zero is also going to remain the very same now what we are going to do is that we have created buttons from zero to nine so now we need to create the buttons for our arithmetic operation that are the plus minus multiply and divide so for that what we are going to do is that we are going to write in plus equal to a button again and this time it is going to add it to the very same root window and the text on the button is going to equal to a plus sign and what we are going to do next is that we are going to specify the foreground color to be white and the we need to specify a comma over here and then we are going to specify the background color the background color is going to be black and then we are going to specify the command that is going to get executed when this plus is going to get clicked so the command is going to be lambda press and it is going to have a plus sign passed and then we are going to specify the height that is going to equal to one and the width is going to equal to seven so this is the plus button for us we are also going to specify the grid for this so we are going to write in plus dot grid and the grid for that is going to equal to row number two and column number three 
so it is going to be row number two and column number three and in the row number two you can see that we have also got buttons over here these are the buttons that are the two sorry the one two three so it is going to be in the line of one two three and it is going to be in column number three so this is the plus button for us where it is added to the root window the text on that is plus foreground color is white background color is black then we've got command passed in we have got the very same function press where we have passed plus this time the height is one the width is seven so let's just copy it again and let's just paste it for the minus sign this time it is going to be minus this one is going to be minus as well this one is going to be minus as well the height and width is going to remain the very same and the grid for that is going to be 3 3 this time then let's just paste it again and it is going to be minus dot create over here as well then we are going to have our multiply button so it is going to be multiply and it is going to be multiply as well then the text on that is going to be a steric it is going to pass in steric and for the multiply the grid is going to be 4 or 3 so it is going to be 4 and the column is going to be 3 just paste it again for the last one that is going to be the divide sign so it is going to be divide divide dot grid and the text on that is going to be a divide sign it is going to pass in this divide sign and then the height and width are going to remain the very same whereas it is going to be 5 and 3 then we are going to have our equal button and for the equal button the command that is going to get executed is going to be very different so let's just paste it over here again and this time it is going to be equal the button is going to add it to the GUI window the text on that is going to equal to an equal to sign the foreground background doesn't matter the command that is going to get executed this time is not going to be this it is going to be equal press so whenever you click on equal button the equal press command is going to get executed the height and width of the button is going to remain the very same whereas the grid is going to be changed from 5 the column is going to be 2 so this is the equal button where the command that is going to get executed is going to change a bit because what equal function is going to do is that equal is going to actually evaluate the expression which you have written in the equation or you can say that the area where you have written the equation which we have created right here at the top as well that is the expression field right over here that is going to be an equation that is basically an instance of the string class sorry not the string class it is the instance of the string variable class all right so we have created our equal button just paste it again and this time it is going to be for the clear button so just write in clear over here clear over here and for the clear button the grid is going to be five the column is going to be one and what we are going to do next is that we are going to specify the text to be clear and the command that is going to get executed is also going to be different that is going to be a function that is named as clear so for now we have not initialized this function so that's why we are getting these red lines right here so this is the clear button for us and finally we are going to have our decimal button so it is going to be decimal equal to button get added to the root window the text on that is going to equal to a dot operator the foreground is going to be white the background is going to be black and the command that is going to get executed is going to be a lambda function that is going to be pressed that is going to pass in dot whereas the height is going to remain the very same that is one the width is going to remain the very same as well that is seven so that is for the decimal let's just specify the grid for this so the row is going to equal to six and the column for that is going to equal to zero 
So let's just evaluate if we have done it correctly, if we have got any mistakes. So first, what we have done is that we have created our driver and in the driver code, first thing we have done is that we have created the root window. Then we have configured the root window, whereas where the background is gray, the title is calculator application and the geometry for that is 270 cross 150. Then we have created a variable that is basically an instance of the string variable class. And the reason we have created it is that we need to have the numbers, we need to have characters like as you can see over here. And then we also need to have the arithmetic operators that are the plus minus multiply and divide in this expression field which we have initialized using the equation which is actually an instance of the string variable class. So we have specified the grid for the expression field, the column span is 4, iPad x 70. Then we have written equation dot set enter your expression. That is going to appear at the time when you have not entered any expression. Then what we have done is that we have created 9 buttons that are from 1 to 9 up till here. Then we have created button number 0. Then we have created the plus, the minus, the multiply and the divide button, the equal button, the clear button and the decimal button. So what's different in that is that from button to 0 to 9 as well as this dot button, what we have done with them also with the arithmetic operator button, the plus minus multiply and divide button we are calling a lambda function press and passing in the operator that is required. Whereas with the equal and clear button, the functions that are going to get called are the equal press and clear button respectively. So that is it with the GUI part. All we need to do now in this driver code is that we need to write in root dot main loop and that is going to help us to execute our code. So that is it with the GUI part. So I guess we should just stop here. And in the next tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are going to code the functions which we have been writing here up till so far. So we are going to code the equal press function. We are going to code this press function and we are also going to code the clear function. And when we code all the three functions, then our code is going to get executed. So I hope that you have understood the GUI part of this calculator, how we are placing them in rows and columns. The grid over here is very important. You need to understand the grid because when you are creating your application of your own, then specifying the grid and knowing where to place your every button, every widget, that is very important. So I hope that you have understood all of that. So I guess that is it with this tutorial. Let me just display the welcome slide for you because I have that slide. It is right here. All right. So thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, I welcome you to another tutorial on this section where we are covering the Tkinter module in Python. And again, I welcome you. And this is the second part of the calculator application which we have started in the previous tutorial. So what we have done so far is you know that we have done, we are done with the GUI part. So in this tutorial, we are going to code the functions. If you remember, we are going to code the press function. We are going to code the equal press function and we are going to code the clear function. So the first thing we are going to do over here is that we are going to create a global expression. So we are going to make it equal to expression equal to an empty. And if you have a look down here, we have already created an expression field over here. That is somewhere over here. Yes, right here it is. So we have already created our expression field. So what we want to do now is that, and one more thing you can see that we have also set this we have, write, we have written equation.set to enter your expression. So now what we are going to do is that we are going to write in def press and you know that it is going to receive a number and it can be a number. It can also be that it can also be that uh, operator that can be at the plus minus multiply divide or it can be a decimal as well. But this is the variable where it is going to get received. Don't just confuse it with number. It can be anything. So for now, just have a look here. Just write in global expression. And in here we are going to write in expression equal to expression. And we are going to concatenate it with the num that is received after converting it to a string. Now what does that mean? Let me just explain it over here. 
so for example you just click on one so one this def press is going to be called one is going to be received in this num expression is going to expression for now is basically empty as you can see right here so expression is going to equal to one and it is going to be get it it is going to get concatenated with the string we have passed so it is going to be something like an empty thing plus one so that is going to equal that is going to make it equal to one then for example let's say after that you just type in a plus operator so plus operator is going to get received in this press function expression which was already one because it was called previously is going to get equal to one plus and the string that has been the number that has been passed after it has been converted into string and it is going to get concatenated to, to the expression which is one for now so plus is going to be written right over here in the expression so the expression now contains one plus so let's say after that you just pass in four so the expression that is previous is one plus and what is going to get concatenated it with this expression is going to be four so that's how basically the expressions is are going to be uh, made so now what we are going to do also is that we are going to set our equation which was set to enter your expression before so we are going to write an equation dot set and we are going to set it to the expression so as you know that equation previously was set something down here you know that equation dot set was equal to enter your expression so now we have set it to the equation or the expression which we want to evaluate so to move down here and let's just go the equal press function so it does not receive any kind of argument now what we are going to do is that we are going to have the try and catch blocks and the try and accept statement is basically used for handling the errors like zero division error or anything like that so put that code inside the try block that may have chances to generate any kind of error and it is going to get caught so we are going to write and try we are going to have our global expression and here what we are going to do is that we are going to use the evil function now the evil function evaluate the expression and we are going to convert it into the string as well and the string function is going to convert the result into a string so we are going to write in total equal to str and we are going to have the eval expression eval on the expression so eval function is used here to evaluate the expression and it is going to convert whatever it has evaluated into a string and it is going to store it in this total variable after that we are going to write in equation dot set and we are going to set it to total whatever the answer that has been generated it is going to be set to that after that what we are going to do is that we are going to make our expression empty again for any kind of next operation you want to perform so that's why we are going to make it empty so after that we are going to have our accept block and in the accept block we are going to just write in equation dot set and we are going to set it to a simple message that is going to say error generate it and after that we are going to make expression equal to empty so that the previous since has generated any kind of error so we can just go on and have our new one and finally we are going to have the last function that is the clear function and clear function as simple as it look it is going to have just the global expression and we are going to write an expression equal to empty and we are going to write in equation dot set and we are going to set it to empty so i hope that you have understood it we have just made the expression equal to empty and we have set the expression to empty because the clear function is going to clear everything so that is what the clear button is doing over here and that is exactly what the clear function will also do so i hope that it is much more clear to you and that is it with this calculator application let's just run it and see if it works perfectly yes it does and as you can see that it is the calculator application let's just scroll it down a bit all right 
So as you can see that you have got buttons from one to nine, then you've got the zero button, the clear button, the equal to button, the plus minus multiply divide button and the decimal button. So let's, and as you can see also that you have this uh, term that says enter your expression over here as well. You can just go on and clear that if you don't want to clear it. And if you just type in any word over here, for example, let's just rerun this code. And you, as you can see that it has enter your expression. If I click on eight over here, you can see that that disappeared from there and it was printed right over here because we have written here as you can see that we have written expression equal to expression plus string num so the expression was made equal to empty and after that expression was concatenated with the string which we have entered that is 8 in our case so you can just add two numbers like 8 plus 2 let's say and just click on the equal button and as you can see that it says 10 and if you want to let's say just have 5 plus 9 you can just write in equal to and it is going to equal to 14 then you can just click on the clear button and it is going to empty everything for example if you have let's say a lot of things on the screen you just click on the clear button you can see that it clears each and everything you can just divide two numbers like 8 divided by 2 just click on equal to and it can see that it generate 4.0 and let's say if you just divide 8 divided by 0 click on equal to sign and as you can see that it says error generated that is the division by zero error which we have specified as a try catch block right over here as you can see that it says gen error generated over here so this is basically our calculator application you can have point numbers like 8.07 plus 8.09 just click on equal to and it is going to equal to 16.16 .16. So that is it I guess with the calculator application if I give you a quick recap as you can see that we have this expression equal to empty we are receiving the expression or you can see that you can say that the numbers are the arithmetic operators over here we are going to convert them into strings and we are going to concatenate it with the expression which is empty for now and we are going to set the equation to that expression as well. Then in the equal press button, we have got a variable total that is going to evaluate the expression. And eval is a function that is going to evaluate the expression. For example, if you just write in 2 plus 2, it is going to evaluate it and it is going to set the equation to the total that is going to equal to 4. And the expression after that is going to equal to empty. Then we have got in the except block, we have got error generated. And then the clear block, we are actually clearing the screen. So then this is the GUI part and it was as simple as that. It was very simple. I don't need, I don't think that I need to explain this again. So I guess that is it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys later.